Now on four, Jamie's in his jammies in a big bed, getting ready to enjoy the 100 greatest kids' TV shows. Get the cool. Get the cool to shine. Only three things in life are certain. Death, taxes, and we would have gotten away with it if it wasn't for those meddling kids. Oh, and another thing's for sure. We can never bring back our childhood. But tonight, we celebrate the 100 greatest kids' TV shows, as voted for by you. 50 years of fuzzy cartoons, slightly sinister puppetry, hilarious slapstick and thought-provoking drama, and some educational stuff that we thought we'd better throw in as well. This is going to be a fantastic show. Rubbish. Can you fix it? School ball buddy, old friend, old pal. I'm thrilled that I played Robin. Always amusing. You used to quite fancy you. Flipping egg. Oh. I'm fond of Nike shoes to keep myself tethered oh, to the This is Berkey's This is Pinky. They must be clean to go on the set. Oh! Thieving kids. Oh, clean it, clean it, clean it! Oh, Eight's a wish and nine's a kiss. I would like to sleep with Lady Penelope. Go ahead, Parker. Right, stop! This is what they want! Really masturbate. We're wide awake! Thunderbirds are go. I'm a big old Hector. Well, show me, big boy. He was frustrated. I was frustrated. You can feel that really hard against you. Two women and a BMW. Away you go! A great big puzzle, old Hector. As that great philosopher Homer Simpson once said, television, friend, mother, secret lover. Maybe that's why so many of you have been moved to vote for your favourite kids' TV shows of all time. Because you care. Yeah, how long ago it all seems? Sooty and Sweep, Zippy, George and Bungle, Hartley Hare. I mean, where are they now? He's not as handsome in real life, is he? <laughs> yes, I think I've seen him in the Priory. The Priory? I didn't know you'd been there. One of my friends has been living there since 1981. <laughs> Did you know Tobol from Pipkins? They found him curled up in a fetal position in the toilets at the Met Bar. Oh, terribly sad. We start with something completely different. A sketch show for kids that was pure Monty Python. <laughs> Do Not Adjust Your Set was, was similar to Python because it had half the Python writers writing it, so it was bound to have the same sort of sensibilities. Can you see that it's coming up on your screens? Yes, it is. And now I'm going to pass this one over to Sir Charles uh, to tell me what <coughs> he thinks of that. Sir Charles, <coughs> what do you make of that? Yes, well, I mean, um, uh, this is obviously a Victorian hunting bowl. Uh, very well made, I, I should think. Uh... I think the content was a bit adult for kids just because the brief was to do a show that made us laugh, not to, not to write down. Could you put a price on it for us? Yeah, I thought you say somewhere in the region of five, four hundred pounds, something like that. A little more definite. Three and six. We were just doing what we would have done anyway, really. So um, the fact it, it was a kid's show was just a kind of excuse. Hello. Is this your first time in the air, is it? What? Is your first time in the air? I mean, I know we're not in the air yet, but if we were in the air, would this be your first time in the air, would it, eh? No, no, I travel across the Atlantic twice a week. Every week of every year? Well, for the last two years, yes. Well, on ever. That means, across, means you've been across the Atlantic 104 times. Two times 52, 104. Isn't that wonderful? Shall I put my safety belt on? They were able to do things that they wouldn't have been able to do if it was for adult television. And I think that is, that's how the BBC eventually allowed Monty Python to go ahead. Water. Oh, we haven't any water. Oh. We've got some tea. Like a cup of tea, love? Yes, please, please. Anything, anything. Oh, oh there's, there's a bit of coffee left if you prefer coffee. <laughs> anything, anything. I mean, just say, which would you prefer? Oh, no, Fizzy Pop would be better for him in than coffee if he's just come across desert. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, no, we drank all the Fizzy Pop, remember, yeah. 
We didn't drink it all, did we? Yes, we did in that lay-by outside Leicester. <laughs> there were stories about people rushing home on Friday nights when he went home to try and catch his kids' show. So in the end, they put the put the second series on uh, at a later time as well. They repeated it at 6.30 or something so people could see it when they got home. I would have said that Do Not Adjust Your Set was, was, was Monty Python uh, for kids. But in truth, it was Monty Python for grown-ups with like this ridiculous lip service paid to it being for kids because he chucked on this kid's song at the end. From Hartsaken in Staffordshire, 11-year-old Wilson Hardy. Next up, it's 1974. It's junior showtime. And it's like glam rock never happened. Just dig that crazy dancing at the back there. Crystal Tips and Alice There was a strange psychedelic animation uh, in Norway known as Kroll Top and Nimian. Crystal tips looked like Bette Midler in a short dress on acid because she also always had this strange grin on her face. <laughs> The death of Annette Mills in a London nursing home has come as a grievous shock to the world of make-believe. She it was who did so much to breathe life into that immortal puppet, Muffin the Mule. Muffin the Mule was born out of necessity. Annette had been a very successful dancer and had had the most horrendous car crash where almost every bone in her body was broken and she spent three years in hospital having been told that she'd never dance again. We want Muffin, Muffin the Mule. During that time in hospital, she came up with the idea of Muffin. We want Muffin, everybody sing. We want Muffin the Mule. Hello. <laughs> so you're here at last. And I remember going to the studio and watching, watching her perform. And now we're going to give you just a little bit of our... Muffin, stop it! She was ill and, um, and died too young. She was only 62. You see, this is our percussion band. I don't think Muffin could have continued without any. No, they were, you know, they were a pair. It's a one-man band, isn't it, Muffin? Yes, one mule band. Sorry. <laughs> Continental essential rollo. Regarda ton singing, a ringing, a binging, a plinging, a tinging, a plinking, a plonking, a boinging a tree. At number 96, that weird cult classic from mainland Europe, the singing, ringing tree. Once seen, never forgotten. But how many of you know it featured the first on screen performance of Rainbow's Bungle? Fresh out of Rada. great deal about Magpie because it was on ITV and my mum used to discourage me from watching ITV because it was advertising funded broadcasting but what I do remember about it was it was the um, the theme tune One for sorrow, two for job. I'm very proud of the name Magpie which was entirely my own uh, choice Three for a girl and four for a boy Magpie was a, a, a complete um, steal they, they thieved it from Blue Peter Five for silver, six for gold. and that's why they called it magpie after the thieving magpie but they never told anybody that seven for a secret never to be told magpie. hello and welcome to Friday's magpie we thought magpie would be more more contemporary, I think, than Blue Peter was, and, and a bit naughtier than Blue Peter. I don't, I don't mean in a sort of sexual sense of naughty, but, you know, uh, uh, would, would be a bit more daring. You can feel that really hard against you. We aimed it at people who were going to youth clubs 
rather than people who had Boy Scouts or Girl Guides later on that afternoon. If you've been doing your sums, you'll probably have noticed that we've still got some money left over. Isn't that right, Mick? Indeed, that is. Well, I had permed hair. Mick's curly hair was natural. And Jenny was a bit raunchy because she'd been in a Bond movie. Remember that you're going to have to stretch it a bit or put, to make some of the flowers, so cut it across that way. Whereas Valerie Singleton hadn't been in a Bond movie, as far as we know. All right, there it is. I made it myself. It's made out of rubbish. We were frightfully kind of raunchy and more like brothers and sisters, and I wore frightfully short skirts and see-through blouses and things. Ah, oh, name. Susan. Rumour had it that Biddy Baxter, who used to run Blue Peter, was very strict with them and they weren't allowed to go out at nights when they were on location, so we heard. But we were allowed to go out anywhere we wanted, do anything we liked, as long as we were there at 8 o'clock ready to film the following morning. On Friday we set what we thought was a very ambitious target, over £3,000 for aids and equipment. Jenny in the corridor will tell you how things are going. We quite deliberately went down this road of having the money. And the nice invention that came up in Magpie was this line that we had in the studio. Believe it or not, the line goes all the way along here. Which started off in the Magpie studio and then, depending how well the appeal went, went right out into the corridors and into reception at Thames at Teddington. And of course in those days we didn't see backstage on television nearly as much, so that was quite, uh, quite daring. Now, the money that you sent in, as I said, is almost unbelievable. It now totals £15,218 and 45 pence. Well, we had a very good message, but I just think some conventional parents thought we were a bit too boisterous, perhaps. We were told um, from some households that they weren't allowed to watch, and you can still meet people now who were not allowed to watch Magpie, but were allowed to watch Blue Peter. It's cheeky Cockney child star Jack Wilde, starring in the very psychedelic HR Puff and Stuff at 94. Though you wonder if it was the director who had been puffing stuff by the looks of this clip. Glad to meet you. Mm. How little papoose. Look, Freddy, an Indian tree. That right, pale face. They not call me Redwood for nothing. On white horses, let me ride away. Ah, that Yugoslavian series, White Horses with the theme tune everyone remembers. Reached number 10 in 1968, you know. And not the only blonde stallion to feature in continental movies around that time. So I've heard. It's a gentle, warm and wonderland far away. Stars oh, come on, we were young, we were green. We had teeth, nice and clean. I still get emails from, from students in Cambridge saying, we're having a bet in a pub quiz. What's the theme tune for Screen Test? We made five programmes originally in black and white, and they were going to go into the summer slot that Blue Peter left when they all went on holiday. And welcome to a brand new quiz programme called, as I'm sure you've gathered already, Screen Test. And we did the next five in colour. So we knew we'd really arrived then. Hello to you. More films, another pile of questions to test your powers of observation in another round of screen tests. The quiz element of it was really boring, I thought, but you got to see some really good clips of films and stuff. It's Malcolm's turn. Here's your question. Blackbeard fired all six shots from the pistol, Malcolm. What did the sixth shot do? What colour was the jumper? The second boy was... Yeah, it was green. And you'd always get one kid that was just a boffin. He's a real nerd. You could tell, you know, thick milk bottle glasses. Obviously, the school spanner would just get dead arms continuously at school for getting all the questions right. Flying start for you. Well done. The registration was T376. <laughs> Let's check the score at the end of the first round. We find we could only have four contestants a week, so there were thousands of, 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 of young people who couldn't possibly ever take part in the programme. So we launched the competition uh, to try and encourage people to take an interest in making films. And we're all going to have a look at the winning entry in the animation section of the Young Filmmakers Competition. It's made by Jan Pinkover and it's called The Rainbow. Once upon a time, not so long ago, 
everything was very much black and white. There were black and white people. Only in one case did we actually come across a piece of film which was spectacularly professional. Doing black and white things and driving black and white cars. And they actually made the excuse of visiting his home to check up on him. They didn't say that was why they were going, but that's what they did, and found out that he had, in fact, done it himself. Eureka! Someone invented colour television. And it was quite, quite, quite brilliant piece of animation. And they all lived colourfully ever after. And it was late, uh, and I remember working through the night on it, and I remember the camera jamming and, and all kinds of production trouble, but we finally, finally got it there. We obviously thought that you'd got the potential of taking it up as a career. Do you think you will? Uh, well, uh, maybe. I wouldn't mind having a bash. I was mostly inspired by the, um, the enthusiasm of people around me, how, how well it was received, my film, and how, how I, the encouragement I got was tremendous. Very hearty congratulations. It really made a lot, a lot of difference to me. Super film. Thanks, Jan. And uh, the next award I won after Screen Test Young Filmmakers competition was considerably heavier. Here comes Bod. At 91, the name's Bod. James Bod. Possibly. Morning, Bod, says Frank. But Bod doesn't see or hear him. He wouldn't have noticed if an elephant had been the postman. Ready! Six in the morning, post-clubbing, nightmare, stroke, nervous breakdown time, mind not really working very well. Suddenly these four characters come on, boop, boop, la, la, boop. And that was sort of, it fitted our mental age at the time. That was how we were talking. It was, boop, 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 la, cup of tea. Uh -oh. Teletubbies, the BBC's latest programme for very young children, is provoking a storm of criticism. While children seem to be entranced by the four colourful tubby characters, many parents and teachers are worried about its lack of speech and question its educational value. Teletubbies. Teletubbies. Say hello. Uh -oh. We thought we'd get the usual stuff about they don't speak properly, you know. I mean, people from Bill and Ben through Pob to tell it, you know, we always get it. Uh -oh. I was at a party and one woman said to me, I've been a nursery teacher for 20 years and my colleagues and I, we're making wax models of you and sticking pins in it. And she was very serious. And I had to leave the party. <laughs> then what happened was young parents began to respond and say, please don't take any notice. Young parents like us, we know how good it is. When Teletubbies was first released in the US, there was an interesting reaction from the religious right. Jerry Falwell, formerly of the Moral Majority, a Baptist preacher, um, claimed that the character Tinky Winky was gay. <laughs> Ah, Tinky Winky smell lovely. <laughs> he was purple, the sort of gay pride color. He had a triangle shaped antenna on his head and he flamboyantly waved a red purse around quite a bit. So that's the end of this part of the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows. Anyone need to use the toilet yet? Don't forget to wash your hands. After the break, lie back with a drink and enjoy the next leg. Actually, talking of which, Titty, I've never seen your legs uh, before. Would you, would you mind? Get the cool.
dive into 24-hour moisture for your face with new Nivea Visage All Day Aqua, a refreshingly light cream combining aquaspheres and minerals to give your face an instant burst of freshness and a lasting source of moisture. New All Day Aqua from Nivea Visage. Pure moisture, 24 hours a day. Toothpaste. Oh, whitening. Protection. Whitening. Protection. I've always used whitening. Trust me, you need protection. You'll be the one who needs protection. You don't have to choose between whitening and protection. Choose new Aquafresh Multi-Action Whitening. It restores your teeth to their natural whiteness gently and also offers protection for your whole mouth. Excuse me. Whitening, protection, protection, whitening. Perfect. New Aquafresh Multi-Action Whitening. Whitening and protection taken care of. Yes, love? Remember when we got back from holiday and our pipe burst and our carpet got totally Wait. ruined? Yeah, direct line delivered us a new one. And when Grandma's cooker blew up? Yeah, she couldn't get it fixed, so she got a new one too. So, even if it's older, you still get a nice new one? Yeah. Mum? Yeah? Does it work with brothers? Direct line's new for old home insurance. Call or buy online and you could save up to 30%. Got far too much stuff. <laughs> the sophisticated look. Looking for the office. But you don't work in an office. Rock chick. Chicky rock. No way. Sex kitten. You cannot walk in those They shoes. are fine. This is the last one. OK. Promise, promise, promise. The natural look? Definitely you. New Palm Olive Soft and Gentle Stick and Cream with Natural Aloe. It soothes as it protects. Get the natural look. New Palm Olive Soft and Gentle Stick and Cream. Go! Thanks to a clever new delivery system called Heatwave, Domino's Pizzas now arrive oven hot to your door. Hmm, it uh, makes them taste better too. Domino's Pizzas, they're hot. Can I get a pint, please, mate? And um, an archers for mm. the lady. Not for me, I'm gonna shoot up. Well, um, I'm gonna hang out for the lads. Yeah? I won't be late. All right then. Yeah, love you. I am in so much trouble. Get the cool. A wise man once said that youth was far too good to waste on the young. And so's kids' telly. So, tonight we've banished the children of Britain to their bedrooms with their, their Game Boys and their sexually explicit text messages and their pokey Digimon bloody trading cards. Yes, tonight, it's adults only. Just remember to check it's OK with your parents, yeah? Hector's house, I love, because I thought Hector was a brilliant bloke. He was really cool. What's that? Do you mind if I come in? Can't you read, Zaza? No entry for cats. I'm not any old cat. I'm Zaza. Oh, it's all the same. Zaza, let's face it, was quite a tasty cat. He wanted to get on with her. I'm very tidy. Tidy, 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 tidy. And that frog, Kiki, would always get in on the act and blow it from at the last moment. There's nobody here at all. He was frustrated. I was frustrated. That he should have got the frog and shook it. I'll always protect you. Thank you, dear old Hector. Oh, it's lucky you're so big. Yes, I'm a big old Hector. A great big puzzled old Hector. This is a story about the wooden tops. Next up, a perfectly old-fashioned nuclear family. Yes, they don't make them like that anymore. They'd probably be MDF tops these days. And Mrs. Scrubbit, who comes to help Mummy Wooden Top. And Sam, who helps Daddy Wooden Top. And last of all, the very biggest spotty dog you ever did see. Run around now! At 87,
Strike a light, it's comedy comedian Mark Reed. A diamond geezer, but surely the most unlikely presenter in kids' TV history. Runaround was a really uh, a funny programme. You were asked to answer a, a question and you had three options. And you had to go and stand on one of, of three answers on the floor. Which coast is the Bermuda Triangle near? You ready, Pat? Go! And then you got this chance to run around and change your mind. I never really understood what the point of the, of the, of the run around bit was. Why they couldn't just run to the, the one they thought was, was the right answer. Next question coming up. And the kid would look at the other kids and go, well, there's so many over there, they must be right, and just jump over at the last minute. Come Which is, I reckon, why we had 18 years of Tory government as well, for exactly the same reasons. People panicked at the poll booth. Oh, there's so many of them. Must be right, jump over. Probably might read, shouting, vote Tory. Come on, kids, quick, hurry up. It was a bit unnerving as well with Mike Reed sort of in charge. <laughs> I'm losing my breath, I'm all sweaty, I'm horrible. Here we go. <laughs> Quite a scary man, big glasses. Looked like a second-hand car salesman even before he was cast as one in EastEnders. Where is Sesame Street, Sesame Street made? He kind of didn't really have a kids' TV presenter's attitude. England? He was quite abrasive with, with the kids. What do you want there, darling? Television, television is yours. You know, really quite like something off the Sweeney. Come down here with me. It was a moon that was a button. And that's all there is to it, really. That's his button moon, shining in blanket sky. It was like the clangers on a budget of 24p. And there's a box, sitting on the paper grass in the light of the moon. I'm all the for encouraging kids to, to have fun with an old cotton reel on a matchstick and to use their imaginations and everything, but I don't expect our makers of children's television, right, to have to resort to the same tactics, no. He's called Mr. Spoon because he's got wooden spoons for arms. Hello, Mr. Spoon. So this is Perky, definitely. This is Pinky. Yes. 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 What do we got? What do we got? We got music. What do we got? What do we got? We got songs. We got jazz. Record and record. Is probably more upbeat, more, and, uh, yeah. a, a little bit livelier, livelier than, uh, than, than, than Pinky. We first arrived in Britain in 1948. That's a very long time. Very long time ago, ago yes. yes and became the British citizens in 1956, was it? Uh, 1956, uh, that's yeah. correct, yes. And first of all, I was working in the coal mine for three years. And I was, I was working the in the nursing home nursing to home, start yeah. with. And, and then afterwards, when we were free to, to choose whatever we, whatever we wanted to do, we decided to do puppetry. <laughs> At one time, Pinky and Berkey had uh, bigger fun mail than the Beatles. I believe they had about 30 uh, albums, uh, long playing albums, and they had uh, uh, singles, they went into hundreds. One of the shows uh, was banned, and uh, it was the... Uh, 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 Pink and uh, uh, political broadcast, it yeah. was called. 
it was before the election. Yes, it happened to it? be yes. recorded before the election and the BBC decided it was uh, too controversial. Hello and welcome to Hammerama, a special opening of Parliament edition. And let's go straight over to the House of Commons now, where Pinky and Perky are waiting to give us their report. Uh, Strangely enough, there was such an uproar about it uh, and uh, they had to, eventually they had to let it go and so it was broadcast, and it was finally. Yes. 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 There is a red carpet being unrolled towards us. Who is it for? <laughs> the Prime Minister? Well, what are we waiting for? Let's get ready to welcome him. It is a good feeling to know yes. that uh, perhaps uh, Pinky and Perky will uh, leave even we'll, after we'll we have, carry on. Uh, we'll, we'll carry on after. Go we have on a little bit, yes. He'll actually have a bit of a tuck and sniff. I have not. You have to. This is really me. There's a bulldog at the back of his <laughs> fingerese. Will you shut up? So that's why I've made up my mind. I'm jolly well carrying on casting the seat aside. At 84, Just William, the kids' comedy that launched the career of Bonnie Langford. Oh well. Say things like that and I'll squeal. No, you won't. I'll scream and scream and scream. Oh, I don't care. I will. I wish you would. I wish you would scream. Can't make Christmas any worse, can it? If I was a kid today, I would not watch The Tweenies. The Tweenies is a frightening programme. The, the people in it are frightening. They're really unpleasant looking. And the poor bastard in the dog. No actor should have to do that. I hope he's getting more than equity rates. When you were a kid, you watched that, and it just seemed like the biggest game show in the world. And Cheggers. He was young enough to kind of, you know, you could almost be his mate, even though he was probably like 20 years older than you. Oh, a deafening sound. <laughs> right, we've got lots of fun and games to get through. We've also got some uh, lots and lots of pop music. So now something that's going to please me, as I'm sure it'll please you, would you believe it? Yes, the pleasers! I met him actually and he said, uh, he told me that the kids used to nick stuff out of his pockets. Both teams have got huge blocks in front of them with letters on. Every show he went to, he'd have to take out his keys and his wallet and his loose change and give it to one of the guys on the floor. Go one, two, three. Thieving kids. Give me your arm, just at first. At 81, it's previously unseen footage of the Ground Force team in their early days, starring a prepubescent Alan Titchmarsh, Tommy Walsh and the gorgeous Charlie Dimmock. The magic is in me. I can feel it. I can feel it. OK, OK, it's The Secret Garden, the um, classic BBC drama series from 1975. He can do it. He can't walk. I know he can. Robin Hood, Robin Hood, riding through the glen. At number 80, the adventures of Robin Hood. He lived in the woods with burly single men in tights, turning Will Scarlet and playing with Little John. But it was his socialist taxation policies which really annoyed the Daily Mail. Robin Hood. I'm the only producer in the world that has to be regularly inoculated against uh, its cast. There's no sign of it. In or out of the river. The series has three main characters. It has Hammy Hamster, uh, Roderick the White Rat and Mr Guinea Pig. When you're getting the animal ready to perform, there are two things you have to do. One is this, because they must be clean to go on the set. And the second is, you wet your finger with your tongue, you wipe his nose like that so that it's nice and wet, and then you put him on the set and blow on his nose. Oh, uh, it's me, uh, Hammy. Uh, uh, do you know anyone who's lost a crystal ball? Hamsters no. are nocturnal, so they only work at night. And <laughs> during the day, you'll get probably about five minutes of performance out of them, and then they'll suddenly go to sleep in, uh, on camera. Over here, 
You have to have a whole selection of hamsters. We have probably six or seven or eight hamsters, and they all look alike. Mm. Yes. Mm. The guinea pigs, now they're not nocturnal, but they're completely stupid, and they'll just sit wherever you put them. They will sit and sit. Are you sure you saw it? Oh, yes. Very clearly. Well, there's only one thing for it. And what's that? Go down in the diving bell and look for it ourselves. The average life of a hamster is, I think, two years, but their working life is probably only about six months. Uh, because hamsters and white rats, they, um, they do age. And that's when Hammy suddenly realises what it is that he's been looking at. We must have gone through many hundreds, yes. They all go to a good home. That's right. You've guessed. <laughs> it's only the moon. I do like a happy ending. And we've only just begun. And now, the gallery. At 78, Vision On, a programme originally made for the deaf, but remembered by all. Especially this bit, where kids sent their pathetic drawings in. Oh, yes, very good. What's that now? And let me guess, uh, two penguins. Right, yeah, now this, what's that? Someone just stood in some paint and bought leaves in the house. Don't tell me, ducks. Oh, yeah, but that's, that's very funny. We are the champions. We are the champions. That was the theme tune, that's how it went. It's very anthemic. 20 points for the first team on the whistle, finishing up standing in their coloured hoop. We Are the Champions was essentially a children's sports day booked to television by Ron Pickering. We are the champions. They have to do sort of these ob obstacle courses and things. Well, we're all ready for our second game. It's our obstacle course plus the coconut shies. This time, the coconut shies are not just a bonus, they're really part of the game. <laughs> Off they go for shy away. And in pairs, they travel down the obstacle course. The Gervin got a good start. Push a ball with their nose and then carry a bucket of sand 100 yards and then give that to someone who then swap it for some water and then they'd have to run backwards blindfolded and mm -mm, mm -mm. and there they are helping one another good teamwork Gervin in second that's Alex Robinson and Janice McQueen. the only good thing in we are the champions was right at the very end and I would watch a whole program just to see this Ron Pickering would shout away you go away you go everyone into the pool and just everyone would jump into the swimming pool and I remember thinking that is the most exciting thing I've ever seen. It was kind of like sex, because the whole show just, just built up to this one point at the end. And that's all anybody watching actually wanted to do. Everything else went before was a total precursor, just building up to this massive climax and getting to jump in the swing pool at the end. At 76, it's Cat Weasel. The wizard catapulted through time in the early 70s. Yeah, right. I saw him last Saturday night drinking special brew out of the carrier bag by the war memorial. Bird of night, hoot not. Feather Looked like him, anyway. Hoot not. Son of Tanit, hoot not. Which hand, Skip? Next up, Skippy, the incredibly intelligent bush kangaroo, the Aussie's most famous export before Jason and Kylie, and perfect fodder for comedy sketches down the ages. Hey, don't shush me. Uh, this is delicate. How do I put this? Uh, it's about that bottom touching thing. Why are you skipping? It's skipping to your dirty little ass fondling pervy bossing. I'm fed up with you goosing me up at every opportunity. You know, once in a while in private after a few drinks, okay, but you need help. At the time, it was the burning issue of the day. It knocked all political debate off the newspaper. Dear Slim, I wrote you, but you still ain't calling. I left my cell, my pager, and my home phone at the bottom. We'd be waiting with bated breath to see the daily figures for who was taking over who. I mean, it was it was incredibly tight. When I jot them, but anyways. What's been up, man? How's your daughter? My girlfriend's pregnant too. I'm about to be a father. At Radio One, there were people walking around saying, if Bob the Builder beats Eminem to number one, this is a tragedy. No, it's not. That's hilarious. Bob the Builder beat Eminem to number one in the charts. That's just superb. Oh, 
always enjoy to knock a rap singer off the top of the charts. So I suppose you grow up all through your teenage years wondering what's going to be Christmas number one, and, and one year it's you. It's a hoot. Come on, team. Let's get going. Can we fix it? Yes, we can! Bob the Builder is a sort of um, a helpful little chappy who lives in Bobland, and uh, he basically is responsible for maintaining the whole village and its buildings and uh, all the roadworks, etc., and um, anything that needs doing in a maintenance way. Bob seems to be able to handle it in the village, really. Yeah, that seems to be his main purpose in life, and to keep his machines well oiled and keep Wendy happy. Hello, Mr. Lazenby. Hi, Bob. Call me Lenny. Oh, right. Well, Lenny, we're all finished. I'm about to test your fountain. I did read in the press that apparently he was this new gay icon and um, it's rubbish. I mean, I can see he's a construction worker, builder, and he's got a check shirt, but nah. Maybe if he had a moustache. Silly me. It tends to freak kids out when their parents go, oh, look, there's Bob the Builder. And you can see some four-year-old looking at me, just going, no way is that Bob the Builder. Oi, 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 come on now. I know it's Channel 4. Any more language like that, you're off the show, all right? Hey, shh, oi. Get the cool. Get the cool to shine. It was back in 1963 when everybody first saw me. I met Oz Smelter and Shorty too. With Alan and I made a game for you. Won the Jungle World Cup, went to outer space. Put the Loch Ness Monster in his place. Climbed the pyramid right to the top. Cause I'd rather have a bowl of Coco Pops. Oh, Coco yeah. Pops are back. See you in a new adventure soon. We'd rather have a bowl of Coco Pops. It's the longest, stretchiest, fruity snack around, around, around. New orange fruit winders from Kellogg's. In three fruity flavors. New Kellogg's real fruit winders. And wind the fruity fun forever. <laughs> Kellogg's secret weapon, Buddha the Cow. Just got a special gadget that helps him make chocolate milk. So now he's fusing chocolate milk with Kellogg's Corn Flakes. Milky. Introducing new Kellogg's Corn Flakes cereal and chocolate milk bars when hunger hits. Milky. Variety comes in packs of eight. But which one to have often leaves me in a state. I'll get my friends to help me choose which ones to have and which ones to lose. But in the end, I just can't wait. If I pick myself, I know I'll get all eight. Kellogg's Variety. Get your hands on all eight. Kate, okay, it's Monday. I got double maths. Don't do it. Too late. Good morning. Double maths. Have some Kellogg's Rice Krispies then. Cheer you up. It's the way Kellogg's toast them. All right, but no singing. <laughs> A one, two, three. Stretchiest, fruity snack around, around, around. New strawberry fruit winders from Kellogg's. In three fruity flavors. Kellogg's real fruit winders. And wind the fruity fun forever. Tony, help! Tiger Man stealing the fastest secret formula. What? Oh, no, he's not. Who moved the horse? 
Hi-ho! Only Kellogg's Frosties have the secret formula that makes them... Yikes! This is the end of the road! For Tiger Man, your secret's safe with me. Nothing like Frosties when you're feeling a bit flat. They're great! Get the cool... Spare ten p for a carrot, Gov. You don't know what it's like sharing a house with a brummy pig. <laughs> yeah. Strange, isn't it, how children's shows have changed over the years. But will Pokemon look as tame as Andy Pandy in 40 years' time? Times change. And let us move with them as we continue our countdown through the uh, bad, badly vandalised window. Pokemon started as a Nintendo game in 1996. And Pokemon was really Japanese for the term pocket monster. The idea being that you can keep this monster in your pocket and take it out when you need to fight another monster in the, the battle scenes that take place on the show or the battles that take place within the video games. Worst quality animation I have ever seen. The plot lines are just appalling and so completely repetitive. I remember the first time I saw Pokemon, we had a tape of it in the office before we decided to, to go with it. And we said, it's badly done. It's like we say, it's like bad animation. And the voices are bad and it looks rubbish. We went, it's never gonna work. Let's have it. If you have a friend who has a rare Pokemon trading card, you might do anything to get that card and trade for it and try to pay for it and so on. And so there have been some incidents on playgrounds of kids beating each other up for, for Pokemon cards, violence, violent interactions. The best bit is when they start to get them all out of the pockets <laughs> and you're there and there's piles growing like that and then all the little characters are coming yeah. out. Are they, they expect yeah. you to have like pockets full of Pokemon cards and things. There's Ant, he'll have the new one! <laughs> Nog in the Nog, it's a name that I thought, actually I thought of it on the, on the, on the tube to Neasden. In the lands of the north, where the black rocks stand guard against the cold sea. Oliver had read Tolkien, and the, the first The Hobbit and things like that, and I think there's a certain amount of Tolkien influence in it. They tell a tale. They tell of Noggin, Prince of the Nogs, and how he sailed to the land of the Midnight Sun to fetch Nuka, Princess of the Nooks, to be his queen. Noggin the Nog is kids' TV, as done by Ingmar Bergman. There's something really bleak about it, the fact that it is actually set in Scandinavia. Graculus was flying above the castle. Everything about it was cold and, and frightening and mysterious. I can't remember any other programme that, that sort of depressed me so, so early on in my life. Oh, Noggin the Nog is my favourite unless you mention anything else by Oliver Postgate and Peter Fermin, Noggin the Nog is, is the best thing ever. I, actually, I was really influenced by Noggin the Nog. I just loved the whole storytelling approach. Graculus turned in the air and dived down to take a closer look. It was not a rabbit. Basically, it's Oliver's narration voice which people remember. When they hear his voice, it always takes them back to their childhood. Graculus bore the little man aloft, high over the hills, and down towards the castle of Noggin the Nog. If he was a kid's entertainer, going around people's parties, like instead of doing a Punch and Judy show, he told these stories, kids would just have to go, they would start crying, and have to be taken home by their parents, because this was not standard kid's entertainment, but therefore brilliant, it was brilliant. Next time I shall put in diamonds and rubies as well, and they will cut you to shreddens. <laughs> In the early 70s, young goons went for it with Michael Benteen's potty time. Hello, and a very warm welcome to... <laughs> Michael Benteen's potty time, take one. Cool. Here's a record player for you, gentlemen, and here are some records. And what would you like? What no. choice? Uh, David Cassidy? David Cassidy. Oh, no, 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 not David Cassidy, the Osman. Oh, oh the Osman. Uh, about... He did all the voices William. himself, Andy you know. William. William? What? We got your mind, your piratical mind. You're coming out of your piratical mind with a hole in it. Hooparoo! <laughs> 
Oh, I knew William. The odd one. You're the odd one to do game with. Hey, stop. Oh, yeah, just oh, stop. Yeah, no. When you come to read uh, Treasure Island, it may not turn out quite like that, but then after all, I've really got a potty imagination. How? How was the brainchild of a brilliant man called Jack Hargreaves? It worked very simply. Four of us in the studio, we'd raise our right hands and say, How? How? And it was, How does this work? How does that work? How does that do that? Simple questions, everyday questions, sometimes more complex, but questions that children wanted answered. How does a captain bring a ship into harbour by following the boys? How can you darken something by putting a light on it? How can I pick up two cups, two fairly solid, heavy cups, with just one balloon? I'd sit there as a kid and go, right, OK, whatever they're just about to do on the telly, I'll copy. How strong is an egg? Dad, can I make this? What is it? It's a nuclear fission reactor. Because the extraordinary thing is, no matter how hard... You... Oh. It's a saline distillation plant, and uh, I need a bottle of uh, washing-up liquid and a small vowel. How strong is an egg? I think these eggs are strong enough to take my weight. <laughs> Nearly 12 stone, plus the box. And it just never, never really worked out for me because I never had enough glue. You could be watching a little bit of history. <laughs> Mary, Mungo, and Midge live in this town. Next, the world's first Mary, it girl. Eight year old Mary, who lived in a penthouse flat with only a dog and a mouse for company. Shouldn't social services have got involved? There are eight flats built on top of each other. Mary, Mungo and Midge live in the flat with the flowers growing in the window box. There's Mary. There's Mungo. And there's Midge. I say, is supper ready yet? I'm starving. It will be in a minute, as soon as the others get here. Oh, here they are. Hurrah! Hello, Hello there. there. Sorry we're late, you two. We had a spot of trouble. But we've managed to rustle up a hamper from the constable's wife. Yes, she was a sweet old thing. She gave us some cold ham and turkey, heaps of tomatoes, hard-boiled eggs, bags of lettuce and lashings of ginger beer. Oh, wizard! Famous five. Name one of them. Not so famous. Not so clever, is she? Blighton. Any more ideas? She went, yeah. Different, is it? Yeah. Secret seven. About some kids, is it, that solve crimes? Yeah. One minute, no more. Get out. We're walking in the At 67, young Alid Jones before his balls dropped. Snowballs, obviously. Christmas just wouldn't be Christmas without it, would it? Double Deckers, I think, was the first seriously made programme for children. Here was sort of like seven kids going out having the kind of fun that kids dream of. OK, Spring, let's have it. Oh. What's up? Spring, will you watch out? There was no parents involved. We had Albert, who was the kind of adult figure in it. But the kids quite often proved to be smarter than Albert. So I think kids suddenly for the first time said, oh, cool, that's great, I'd love to be a part of that. It was 
filmed at Borenwood Elstree when all the old films were being made, all the Hammer films were being made. And I came out of my dressing room and I looked to the left of me and there was Peter Cushing. And I looked to the right of me and there was Christopher Lee. And it was just like, God, this is amazing. You just saw all the stars. It was just fantastic, a fantastic time. The cleverest child If you're the strongest The longest You've never been wrong If you're the latest The greatest Then you can state That you're a record breaker Facts and record Could be perceived as quite dry What prevented that Was just the, the enthusiasm And sort of the really bubbly character Of Roy Castle Who really brought that programme to life Keep me in order Make sure that I don't cheat. Are the two men who know more about records than anyone, Norris and Ross McWhorter. And even though he was balanced with the two Ross brothers, who Norris. did tend to sort of present this sort of the dry, factual um, face of the programme. How many new world records have been broken? Oh, well, uh, we um, got up to about 1,100 new ones. and well, uh, stopped we... counting after that, yeah. Yeah, because there are so many. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. What really helped to counteract that was Roy Castle, because he didn't really behave like an adult. He ran around, he was very enthusiastic, very excited. Hello. Hello. Are you part of the biggest tap dancing trope in the whole world? Yes, I am. They used to do these en masse record attempts, so they'd fill BBC TV Centre with hundreds of revolting little madams in tap dancing costumes. <laughs> they'd all be <laughs> trying to be spotted by Mum on the camera like this, doing sort of an en masse tap dancing time step record or something like that. At 64, we all recognise Lassie. But did you know that child star Tommy Rettig, who played his companion, was allergic to dogs? Yes, Lassie, I, I know it's hard to bear, boy, but uh, you, you'll get over it, believe me. You voted for that? Have you no shame? One day, Ricky the Magic Pixie went to visit Daisy Bumble in her tumble-down cottage. He found her in the bedroom. Roughly, he grabbed her heavy shoulders, pulling her down onto the bed and ripping off her... <laughs> Jack and Nori. Jack and Nori. Jack and Nori was a classic. There was nothing ever wrong with Jack and Nori. I found that really boring when I was young. When it started, nobody really wanted to do it because, you know, this was a sort of, you know, kiddie story time thing. But then gradually, when they realised um, that it was five, 15 minutes solo a week, uh, it became a very popular thing to do because it's great. it was a great showcase for actors. That's quite enough of that! The fat shopkeeper shouted. Every week, different person reading the story, or every day, different person reading the story. And then one night, in December, when they were all sitting around the fire, the owl, Tutu, suddenly said, I used to sit down with my milk and my digestive biscuits and want something, ooh, and Jack and Ori always seem really slow. Ooh, shh, what's that noise? I suppose it was uh, like bedtime stories at tea time, you know, kids, uh, sitting down after their tea um, and just uh, being entertained. Mum must have loved it, of course. You know, sit down, watch Jack and Ori, or else. Yeah, 15 minutes of quiet, perhaps, yeah. They heard the sound of someone running. Then the door flew open and in ran Chi Chi the monkey. They must have had one of the most illustrious casts ever for Jack and Ori. I've come to the last part of the story about Ben Blewett. When a man grows hair all over his face, it is impossible to tell what he really looks like. So be a good boy and don't get up to mischief. Did Prince Charles do one, I think, did he? The old man of Dudar up the mountain. The old man was so big and fat after many years of living on grouse patty and blaberry pie. Probably did all the drawings as well. Very clever, you know. One day, he decided to see if he could climb up the cliff of Loch Nagar. 
and it was kind of educational, so I think your parents didn't mind you watching it. But no one can rubbish Jack and Ori. I used to always turn over on that point. Andy Panny started in 1950 when rationing was still in force, so children wouldn't necessarily have had sweets. But what they were starting to have was children's television. Andy? Andy Pandy? It was the programme which started the use of the phrase watch with mother, which has been a key phrase in children's television. Watch with mother was, was the biggest myth, because nobody watched it with their mother. You know, nothing wrong with my mum, but we didn't watch it with her. She, had, she was busy making the shepherd's pie or doing washing or, or whatever. She didn't watch Watch With Mother with us. We watched those kids' programmes without mother. That was the whole point. They were our mother. <laughs> I hope Louie Lou doesn't mind. I think what was appealing about Andy Pandy was the whole idea that maybe your toys could come alive, that maybe they had a whole world outside of the time you were with them. So when you turned off the light at night, that maybe, just like what was sort of brought to life in Toy Story, is all, the animal, your, all your toys would communicate and be having an awful lot of fun. Dust the table, dust the chair, sweep and polish everywhere. Dust the table, dust the chair, sweep and When you look at those tapes now, it's astonishing. If you're used to watching computer-generated cartoons with your children, it's amazing because his strings are so visible. And actually, I remember even as a child pointing out that you could see the strings. Jump in, Teddy. I was mad about the whole lot. I just, I just could never figure out why they all had to live in a basket. Time to go home, time to go home. And, and Teddy. We all just do impersonations of Teddy waving goodbye because he couldn't bend his little arm, could he? Goodbye, children. Goodbye. At 61, Black Beauty, the crime-fighting horse with an IQ of 173. The adventures of Black Beauty, Black Beauty being a horse, who managed to get into many different kinds of scrapes, as horses do. <laughs> and then the owners would be able to surmise from the look on the horse's face. <laughs> All oh, right. OK, so there's a problem down at the old well, you know, and the horse will be going, I don't know, I haven't been there, but I wouldn't mind some hay. Any chance of some hay? What have you been reading recently? You think I imagined it. Mm. You think I didn't see anything at all? It was one of those kind of shows that said nothing to me about my life, as Morrissey would say. It was just set in the country somewhere with a horse. And uh, I lived in Ilford with no horse. But, you know, good on them for looking after the Radio 4 types who watch television. I didn't imagine it, did I, Beauty? And you didn't imagine it. I had always imagined it as this character trapped inside the television. <coughs> I happened to be in a train, it's so long ago, where there was a corridor and I was sitting at the end of a compartment and a little child came along the corridor and breathed on the glass at the end of the compartment and started to draw pictures and I played the game from the inside and I suddenly thought, that's what we can do. <coughs> he would spit on the screen and go, Cover the screen with spit, then write P R B. Pub was, I think, a very, very early uh, Teletubby, because the whole Teletubby's thing is, uh oh, and all that, which is hello. But Pub would talk like that. He would talk like a, a baby. Me and my brother would love Pub. We're three years apart in age, but Pub just universally got us together. We'd start fighting, or we'd hold hands, we'd bond over Pub. An awful lot of people still ask. I mean, they come into our premises in Stratford on Avon and say, oh, you know, the, oh, everybody knows about Rosie and Jim and the Teletubbies, but I tell you, the best programme ever you made was Pob, you know. <laughs> so he's still, he's still remembered. <laughs> Hi. 
Trouble is, getting typecast, lovey. Thirty years on, nobody wants zips. Every audition it's, can you do Velcro for us? Velcro? Velcro? Of course I can't do Velcro. I don't do Velcro. One doesn't do Velcro. Get the cool. Get the cool. New Crunch from Weetabix is honey toasted to stay crunchy in milk for ages. You might even have time to chat to your wife. So, been up to anything lately? Oh, yesterday, just after I dropped the kids off, the strangest thing happened. And that's what happened. Oh? Crunch, the breakfast you can take your time over. Bagless cyclone cylinder cleaner in the world with an easy to empty dust chamber. LG Psyking. Prepare for the funniest full scale war the world has ever known. Ah! Cats and dogs in cinemas everywhere now. Take good care of my baby. Now don't you ever make her cry. Just let your love surround her Paint a rainbow all around her Don't let her see a cloudy sky No one knows more about nourishing babies than SMA. That's why Progress Follow-On Milk from SMA has a special recipe to take good care of your baby. Let me talk to you about stain removal. Right now, if there is a better way to remove those stubborn tea, coffee and wine stains, then Excuse I, for me. one, would like to know about it. I'll show you. Oh, look, there's always one. Go on, mate, you show me. Take that. Take that. Tedious tannin stain. Take that. Terrible tannin. New Orbit White helps knock tooth stains into orbit. They taste pretty good, too. Hugo Deep Red, for women only. Your fragrance, your rules. New Crunch from Weetabix is honey toasted to stay crunchy in milk for ages. Crunch, the breakfast you can take your time over. Fantastic deals are available across the Fiat range. Just call 0800 71 7000. Meet Tariq and Abdul. They've got life sorted, but their father is making other arrangements. You're lucky you two, aren't you? Landing a couple of belters like these. The network premiere of East is East, Sunday at 9 on 4. Get the call. Welcome back to the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows. Over 200,000 votes were cast on their behalf, and what interesting reading they made too. Blue Peter was the programme preferred by Britain's over 50s, whereas Thunderbird still sends most 25 to 34 year olds into orbit. Those in full-time education prefer The Simpsons, whilst the unemployed, for some strange reason, are just crazy about Wurzel Gummidge. Meanwhile, the favourite kids' TV show of the heavy smokers polled 
was Grange Hill. So much for that. Just say no campaign, hey Zamo? Actually, I think that was crack. I always remember watching Newsround and feeling sorry for John Craven, because obviously he was a, you know, a proper journalist, and he'd come up with this great idea, and he'd come in you know, every day to the producer and go, right, let's do a story about the AIDS epidemic. And they'd go, no, it's too much. What about trouble in the Middle East? No. Here's the story today, John. Three, two, one. Did a little da did a little da Good news if you're a natter jack toad. A massive new experiment to make it rain. Our brief was to make what was happening in the world interesting to children, especially children aged from 5 to 12. Tonight we begin with news about rain. I'd sit back and say, John, you are nine years old. What is going to interest you about this? What words will you understand? What references? What phrases? What won't you understand? The biggest experiment ever to make it rain when we want it to is now, uh, soon to begin rather, in central Spain. Not that we gave a monkeys, to be honest. I can't remember many kids going, this is all very well, Scooby-Doo, but I want to know what's going on in the EEC. Come on, John, give us the news. No, we didn't really care, but, you know, we were glad that they thought we did. It's just one part of a huge plan by the United Nations to study the weather on Earth more accurately than ever before. From the very early days, the very best reporters were all more than willing to report the news round. This is Michael Burke for News Round in Paris. John Humphreys for News Round in Moscow. Bob Friend in Hiroshima for News Round. And I suspect that one of the reasons was that, you know, they all had children. <laughs> And normally their children didn't watch them on the main news, but they would watch them on, uh, on Newsroom. Well, finally tonight, at London Zoo today, an unusual kind of small cat called a Marge has made its first appearance. I did 3,000-odd Newsrounds, and I never got tired of it. I never got tired of the challenge every day of explaining this often complicated and violent world uh, to a young audience but a world which also had some really positive sides to it. Luke is tiny now, but even when he's fully grown, he'd be less than a metre long. Newsround was a bulletin which gave us time and space to reflect all aspects of life on Earth. Doesn't he look nice now, but I wouldn't like to come across him in a few years' time. That's all from Newsround today. See you again, I hope, at the same time tomorrow. Until then, bye-bye. <laughs>
And I know he became rather unpopular and, and frowned upon in, in recent years, um, but I certainly learnt a lot about animals from, uh, from Johnny Morris. Not about Impressionism, though. Eh? Oh, no. I'm not going to play with you. At 56, the adventures of Mole, Rat, Badger and Toad of Toad Hall, all set in Edwardian England. And did you know that's Del Boy David Jason playing Toad? Amazing makeup. <laughs> oh, well done, Toad! Oh, oh Toad! <laughs> Pride cometh before a fall. an awfully good set, those pipes. <laughs> Bill and Ben, Bill and Ben, Bill and Ben, Bill and Ben, Flowerpot Men. The Flowerpot Men was a very simple idea. Um, the puppeteers would stand behind a sheet of hardboard with a scene painted on it, a few props in the foreground, and some very, very simple puppets. Then the little weed knocked gently on the other flower pot. And out came the other flower pot man. They leaned over the edge of their flower pots and said hello to each other. Hot or boop. Hot or boop. In grown-up TV, most of the arguments are about bad language swearing. And in children's TV, they've been about pretend language and the idea that in some way children were being corrupted because they weren't hearing the Queen's English spoken crisply by their characters. And Bill and Ben were the first example of that. Hot up to pop weep. Hot up to pop weep. <laughs> I thought they were pissed. I couldn't, <laughs> I couldn't understand what they were. What was that language? Somebody must have. What if they had a script? Oh, <laughs> said Bill, suddenly feeling much better. And he started to do a little dance. I remember as a kid sitting there thinking, why am I watching this? It's like, I mean, you watch a lot of TV like that, but as a kid it was quite a weird thought. Why am I watching this with, with Mummy or whatever? Because Mummy was clearly bored out of her brains. It exuded charm. And for that reason, children loved it. And I know that children, young children today who watch it also love it. So, um, 11 out of 10. <laughs> Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Ben. Bill and Ben, Bill and Ben, power pot men. Goodbye, Bill. Goodbye, Ben. Bill and Ben, Bill and Ben, power pot men. I'm a very friendly lion called Parsley with a tail for doing jobs of every kind. But I mustn't treat it roughly or too harshly, for it's such a useful thing to have behind. Eating too many sweets is bad for your teeth. Rubbish! What do you think of it so far? Rubbish! But what? I mean, oh, it's very nice, very nice and comfy looking. The weird thing about Pipkins is that all the puppets were so tatty. I mean, they were just disgusting, flea-bitten things. Hartley was just this rotten old rag. There's Tortoise. Tortoise is watching me. What are you hiding under those papers, Hartley? He was a bit like Kenneth Williams. I'm sure I'm not the first person to, to spot that. He had that about him, and he was clearly a single man. Oh, well, show me, big boy. Just come over here and show me. At the time, no way did we know that he was camp. Didn't even know what camp was. Camp's only something you can, you can sort of put on something years and years later. Wouldn't you like to go into the yard and paint it? No, because we, that is, you and I, are going to the dentist. The dentist. Oh, dear. <laughs> Time for us to clean our teeth. And don't forget to clean yours either. In the chicken puppet van. I do hope no one voted for Bugs Bunny. I hate that rabbit.
Timmy Mallet. Oh, even now I just get angry with Timmy Mallet for wasting so much of my childhood. <laughs> I just remember thinking, Timmy Mallet is just such a knob. Yes, at 52, it's the man who made a rather large spectacle of himself every morning. And an ass, to be honest. But you obviously loved Whack -a Day and the Wide Awake Club. That's free country, I suppose. Wacky birthday to you. Timmy Mallet was actually splendid. I think he's one of those guys who was born to be a children's presenter. Kids loved him. All those things with his windscreen wiper glasses, and all those props, and his, you know, his mallet and all that stuff. I thought he was a great children's entertainer. He was sort of, he was harmless. He was irreverent. He was, he was just silly, and he was like a huge grown-up kid. Right, our two finalists. Who have we got? Paul and and Victoria. Right, okay. <laughs> Mallet, smell it. A word association game where you must have caused a hesitation. Repeat a word to say a word I don't like, otherwise you get bashing out like this. Or like this. The one with the most bruises loses look at each other and go, Blair! 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 What do you say at home? Blair! Exactly. See, people still do it to this day. It's so, so silly. Cupboard. What? Cupboard, yes. Wardrobe. Yeah. Drawers. Drawers. Desk. Ah! There's too much energy in him oh, and too sorry. much. Oh, yeah, I'm really whack. Anything that's wacky or kooky or zany should not be on television. <laughs> I'm ready to oh. play the whack pack because we're going to be looking at wacky instruments later on in the programme today. And what else have we got? Oh, we've got some live music in the studio from Blue Zone, which yeah. is good. And, and we're also going to hear how people in the 18th century used to make themselves look pretty. Now it's time for our cookery spot. Today we'll be showing you how to make a glass of water. The Wide Awake Club had been going water. for several years when um, we had a letter from a young chap called Mike Myers. Oh, and, right. uh, and he and his mate street? Malarkey came up with this idea called the Sound Asleep Club. Sound asleep. What are we? We sound asleep. You would never have expected from what he did on the Wide Awake Club that he'd go on to be one of Hollywood's top funny men. He was quiet, he was thoughtful, he was funny. Here's some earrings made out of spoons. But you wouldn't now, have picked him out. Some spoons? some string and a piece of tape. It is, of course, a sausage day, sausage day, sausage day. Can't believe we've been taken over by German bangers today. We've had, of course, hamburgers in Hamburg. I think Frankfurt Kids TV needs people like him. I don't know what he's doing now, but I mean, he was, he, was, he was a good laugh, a good turn. I do a lot of student gigs these days. I find that uh, all the wide awakers have grown up now and they're all um, at university. And what they want is uh, Whackaday exactly the same as it was when they were children. This man will be our hero, for fate will make him indestructible. His name? Captain Scarlet is a war story. <coughs> the enemy are the Mistrons. This is the voice of the Mistrons. They wanted to look at the Earth people to see what they were like. We know that you can hear us. We've been spotted. They're obviously hostile. OK, Lieutenant, let them have it. This misunderstanding triggered a war which went on for 39 episodes. Captain Scarlet, he's just indestructible. <laughs> I used to think he was saying, Captain Scarlet, he's instructable. Suggesting that you could just get him to do the washing up and stuff. Oi, Captain, turn the telly over. Captain Scarlet! He'd get into all sorts of scrapes, and you'd think, how's he going to get out of this? And then you think, well, it doesn't matter, he's indestructible. So they could saw him up, presumably, into pieces, and next week he'd be fine. Captain Scarlet. Sir? When we interviewed the artists that were being tested for the voice of Captain Scarlet, Francis Matthews said, would you like to hear my Cary Grant voice? And we said, yes. And of course, instantly, it was just wonderful. The 
rendezvous took place as planned, all security arrangements have been attended to. We used every trick in the trade to try to convince the audience that the puppets were doing things that they couldn't possibly do. Just an electronic check, sir. The hands were usually cast and they were unmovable. So we would take a member of the crew and that crew member would then put his or her hand in the shot. I don't think we really fooled the public that these weren't real hands, but you know, we, it, it helped the storytelling. Finger bobs. Yuffie lifts a finger. And a mouse is there. These hands were made for making, and making they must do. When you think about it, the cast was made of paper, and paper's very cheap. And I spent the days under the table with my hands in the air. It's exhausting. I am the mouse called Finger Mouse, the mouse with guts and verve. You put a cone of card on the end of your finger. Cooey! And you have to Cooey. do things with it. You can see what happens. So a device was arranged, a piece of pink foam rubber in there. And when it was filled with foam rubber, it would hold onto your finger, and it looked like a little vagina. So that's what it became. Finger mouse. Get a vagina for the mouse, will you please? Or could you revaginate this mouse for us here? And I think revaginate, I think I invented that word. This could be my lucky day, says Gulliver. And he is in luck. The cushion splits and all the feathers fall out. So when we'd done the last shot of the second series, and I didn't want there to be a third series, believe me, two years under that table was enough. I conspired with the cameraman to keep the camera rolling, and we took the mouse, and I dunked him in my cold cup of coffee and drowned him. That's the end of the story. Get the cool. Well, that's it for another part of the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows. We're halfway through, you know, but plenty more to come. I mean, you haven't seen any of this lot yet. They're called the Dynamic Duo. We did it! Ha-ha! <laughs> oh, and they're all chocolate. Wait, I like chocolate. Ah! <laughs> right, stop! This is what they want! It's Cracker Jack! Thank you for allowing a monster into your living room. <laughs> Flip an egg, Benny. Pew, pew, Barney McGrew. Look at these, Mr. Gummidge. What is it, honey? Don't keep everyone away from your child. The chip is farted. No, it's not me. It's you. It's no use, Pinfield. Schoolboy buddy, old friend, old pal. I think you used to quite fancy you doing that. Glad to see I'm the centre of attention. That's a great show. Really, Master Bait. It was a very embarrassing, humiliating experience. I wanted to do Shakespeare. <laughs>
New Flash Bathroom cleans great and helps stop dirt sticking. So that time, after time, after time, your bathroom hardly needs cleaning. New Flash Bathroom keeps on doing the hard work so you don't have to. Where can you feel refreshed? Where can you find a feeling of rejuvenation? How about in your clothes? Awaken your senses with a scent inspired by natural plant and herb extracts inside new Lenore Natural Balance. Lenore, for clothes you love to live in. Only 18.45, you must have some wrong. 7.99 plus 48, borrow one from Barbara, take off the doodah, hang on. Three little piggies, one went At Tesco, nine. our back to school range is at our lowest possible price. Incredible! 18 pounds 45. Hmm. Tesco, never little house. My most attractive feature, my hair. It's always been, but science has played its part. New L'Oreal Elvive Shampoo with Regenium for hair becoming thin over time. Regenium, derived from one of hair's vital substances, penetrates hair to help bring back thickness. Shampoo after shampoo, my hair feels replenished, thicker and fuller. Impressed? I'm not just impressed, I'm convinced. New L'Oreal Elvive age-defying shampoo with Regenium. It's a real discovery for me. And you too, you're worth it. Only at Boots, a fantastic way to save on big brand toiletries. You can choose any combination of three everyday toiletries from the hundreds of products on offer and get the cheapest one free. Come into Boots today for your favorite brands to mix and match. Now available at most Boots stores. Nissan Micro Active now comes with a rear parking distance sensor, air conditioning, and a year's free insurance. Idyllic. Get the cool. You know, we have learned so much from children's television, haven't we? I mean, like Bill and Ben taught us about the essentially non-verbal components of language. Uh, how? Uh, taught us to respect the ancient culture of the North American Indian, and Hong Kong Fui taught us never to give the caretaker's job to a crime-fighting dog. And let's not forget that Kids TV was the training ground for many of today's fully-fledged celebrities. One minute you're walking around on all fours pretending you're an elephant, the next you're on Star Lives with Carol Vorderman. <laughs> It's weird to think now that there was a time when there was just no television at all on Saturday mornings. The ITV Money Men realised that there was a, a serious commercial market out there that was untapped. Uh, loads and loads of kids just sitting around bored out their brains on Saturday mornings. And in fact, within about a year, it's quite sad actually, within about a year of Tisbell's coming on the screens on ATV and Birmingham, which is where it all started, most Saturday morning cinemas in the Midlands completely closed down. It was just a madhouse, it was just kids roaring about with sort of me as this glorified ringmaster. Uh, very cheap budget, very, very cheap budget. I remember I used to do it for an extra 25 quid for three hours on a Saturday morning, which I thought was good, and still do. I'd just like to say a quick uh, hello to some of the lads in the forces. So oh, I'm not again. Well, I haven't got time to say hello to everyone oh, that's written in. Sally James, God bless her. Yes, we ordered a bit of a lush on Sally. But she had big hair. HMS Osprey, HMS Seawalk, and HMS Ariadne. Mm -hmm. I hope to have more Huge more. amount of families, actually, the dads secretly were watching Tiswell's to look at Sally James's legs. And I promise, I must just say one thing, I promise lots of you have asked for photos, I promise during the summer I will get that organised. Right. <laughs> it's just nice to know that they haven't reverted back to their old ways of throwing buckets of water after each news flash. Thank you. <laughs> Good morning, welcome to the 146th Swap Shop. Multicoloured Swap Shop then started up on the BBC and it became very much like, are you a Tiswas house? 
or are you a multicoloured swap shop house? Hello, Warren. Hello. Good morning. What can I do for you? I'd like to make a swap, please. You're a swapper as well. And the, and the swap shop houses were very nice little twee middle class children. I'd like a um, mini and two BMWs. The Tiswas kids were just, you know, anarchic. Oh dear, the flanfling has snuck in again. He's putting a custard pie underneath them as they. This is monstrous, even by his own unspeakable standards. But I was never that fond of custard. I mean, I, I spent eight years of my life. But, you know, my car smelt the custard, my hair smelt the custard, Lenny smelt the custard, sat, we all smelt the custard. Excuse me, sorry about this. All right. Morning. I liked buckets of water. The great thing, the, the comedic thing about buckets of water is that they change somebody's face at once. <laughs> oh. It could only ever have been done once in its lifetime because it was done at a studio, at a station, and they didn't have a head of children's department. So there was no one to say, my God, you couldn't do that. And now, Susan here. Now, <laughs> Susan has got something here we're going to show you. Now, look at that. Oh! Enough of what a pain. Look, look, goes the wrong way around. Yes. Put it away, please. Oh, can you do it with the other arm as well? Can I have that back? Just that arm? Please, please, can I have my finger back? Thank please. You. It was very nearly taken off by the IBA within like a couple of months. And it's sort of. It sort of weathered the storm, and, and, and ATV were quite strong about saying, no, yeah, give it a break, for Christ's sake, you know, you know, give them time. You know, it's, it's very successful. They're not really, you know, at all horrible anti-children people. I mean, it's, it's just a riot. It's just a load of kids running about, whatever, you know? Yeah! Great stuff! This is what they want! Who needs crossroads with this sort of stuff? Eat your heart out, blankety blank! This is what they want! I think what's weird now is how many people talk about it you know, as if it was some terribly complicated intellectual exercise that we were trying to break through a brave new dawn of, of kids' television, which we weren't at all. We were just having a... This is the stuff they want. No wonder Noel Edwards is out of work. This is incredible. <laughs> Fantastic stuff. This is one of Europe. They're called the dynamic duo. So I felt that Batman should always be dynamic. In other words, constantly moving, never still. Come on, Rob. Always musing, always planning, always about to do something or in the midst of it. Let's go. I was doing a movie in Europe, and uh, I came back, and my agent said they have a new project at Fox and ABC. This is going to be a big one. And I said, what is it? And he said, Batman. And then I thought, oh, come on, come on, come on. I'm trying to have a serious career here. Put any fears you may have had aside, Commissioner. We're back in action. Batman, Batman, the answer to a policeman's prayer. Thank you, Commissioner. Good night. It was satirical or camp, whatever you want to call it. Holy impossibility. Precisely, Dick. Something strange and unusual is going on. It was bigger than life with our zany, uh, oversized villains, um, almost Shakespearean. Your little game is over, Joker. Robin, take him to the Batmobile while I clean up the rest of this debris. Right. And if you want to pollute any more water, you'll find plenty where you're going. Up the river! The chemistry with Bert and me, uh, as soon as we got on stage, we will kind of assume those characters. To the Batmobile! It just seems to click right in and work. We had this wonderful friendship. And as a result, we were able just, you know, I mean, we forgot that we were actors and we just Hey, we took on those roles. We became Batman and Robin when we were in costume, or Dick Grayson and Bruce Wayne when we were in our civvies. Have a whiff of bat gas. You know, it's not fun to run around uh, 12 hours a day in itchy tights and uh, have to plan all of your bathroom stops and watch your stomach after lunch because the utility belt didn't have much flex. It's impossible, Batman. Your assets are tied up by a hundred ironclad trusts. Precisely. At the risk of alarming you, I can see only one. What would happen to Bruce Wayne's fortune if he suffered a fatal accident? Gosh, I guess I, Dick Grayson, would inherit it. I'm thrilled that I played Robin. I mean, uh, I experienced a success that very few actors in their careers ever expect or ever received, and I am not at the least bit bitter. Certainly I'd like to have done other things, but I did do something that will always be throughout history a classic. 
total family entertainment, loved, still shown all over the world. If I go into a hotel and, and the television is on or something and it's playing, I'll stop and I'll watch. Look, a living bat skeleton. Batman. Hey, it's a bat. It's Batman. What am I doing? No, no. What's he doing? What a nut. Gang was brilliant on two levels. The first thing about it which was brilliant was the idea that school kids could go off and kind of run their own newspaper like the adults behind their backs, lock the door and cut it for themselves in the real world. The best thing about it was the relationship between Spike and Linda. Everybody loved Spike and Linda and were they going to get it on, weren't they going to get it on? I think it was kind of based on that moonlighting idea. What do you want, Spike? Oh, nothing. Just looking. Linda. Well, couldn't you look somewhere else? I'm finding it difficult. Nice pyjamas, Linda, but I prefer your other ones. You've never seen my other pyjamas. He's never seen my other pyjamas. I've seen everything you wear, Linda. I got pictures of your clothesline. I think I wanted to be Linda Day. I know that my first boyfriend fancied Linda Day, and I used to look at what she used to wear, her long max, her trendy little skirts, and the whole way that she treated her staff. I mean, I hope to God that I'm not quite as much as a despot as she is. Sam, not in yet. Linda, I wouldn't. Go away, Linda. By the way, for every hour I work past one o'clock, I want a night off next week, OK? Catching up on your sleep, I expect. She's as tough as any editor I've had. I mean, I've worked in newspapers like The Sun and The Mirror and The Mail on Sunday, and Linda probably cut it with the best of them. <laughs> There's a whole load of parents on their way here to drag us back, tuck us in, and maybe read us a bedtime story. Oh. Well, they're not going to get away with it. No way. I've locked the doors. Hooray! No one gets in here till we're finished. Yay! Or gets out. Take a few jaunty trouser suits, the drummer from Flintlock, and some, frankly, disturbing opening titles, and what have you got? The Tomorrow People materialise at number 46. Ah, oh, it's good to be back. Hey, we're not back. This isn't the lab. Looks like your time discs haven't landed us in quite the right place, Peter. You any idea how far we are from the lab? Well, this is the exact location of your lab. It isn't, you know. Even I can tell that. Are you sure we're in the right time, though? Well, this is the exact date. 1974 AD. So what's gone wrong? <laughs> Saturday morning, the BBC was for kids. Multicolour Swap Shop was a groundbreaking programme. There'd never been a Saturday morning programme on the BBC that ran for three hours without a script. If you had a toy that you wanted to swap, you could phone in and swap it with someone else's toy, which is a brilliant idea. Would you excuse me a moment? I want to take a phone call. That'll be all right. Let's have a, a call to Linda Baker. Hello, Linda. Hello. Good morning. What can I do for you? I tried to make a swap. Noel Edmonds, it was a sort of terribly avuncular gentleman. He always had cosy jumpers, and he always looked as if, you know, he had a plate of scones never five feet away from him. Right. Where about you, Linda? Hi, Wickham. It was a safe pair of hands. It was like David Seaman in the Saturday morning slot. Um, and, and you couldn't help but like him, really, but he, he was a bit soft around the edges. This part of the world I know very well. What are you offering? Um, fabulous hair crimper. Sorry, I didn't hear that. Noel Edmonds at the time, it was, you know, was brilliant. You had John Craven, who seemed like a really cool, wacky guy. <laughs> I haven't got my script. <laughs> I was used on Newsround to having scripts, you know, every word was scripted. Oh dear, ill-prepared today I was. No, not that script, Tony. And here I was in the middle of this informality uh, and having a ball. 
Right then. Can you do the next thing and I'll come back to it? Well, I would have thought... Is it um, possible? I would have thought it was quite possible to go to the top ten board right now. Would you think that was a distinct possibility? It's taken us an awful long time to get to where we are today. In fact, it's taken five hours, hasn't it? It had um, the squeaky clean Maggie Philbin and the cheeky and irrepressible Keith Chegwin. While we were on the train coming down from the Swap Shop studio, we discovered that we'd both been to this part of the world on holiday. You could tell there was a bit of a thing going on with Cheggers and filming at that time. Probably you would nick my beach ball and nick my ice cream corner and all the things like that. Oh, now, would I do a thing like that, Keith? I think you would, Maggie. <laughs> I think once I phoned in and said, I've got a naked Pepper doll. Uh, can I swap that for a rocking horse? I didn't get anywhere. I used to like Captain Pugwash. There were lots of sort of strange, naughty things in Captain Pugwash. I can't believe the names they got away with. Plundering purposes, Master Mate. Precisely, Pirate Barnabas. There was Shag the Cabin Boy, famously. Um, there was uh, Lieutenant Reach Around. Um, and Mr Bates, the wanker. Just look at that there bird. Really, Master Mate. Captain Quiet Tom. <laughs> Willie! Somebody will always come up and say, oh, they, they had uh, Master Bates and Seaman Staines and a character called Roger the Cabin Boy. Uh, but that's actually not true. Uh, and a national newspaper had to apologise for suggesting it. We'll all have supper in bed tonight, Tom. And mind, it's a good one. Aye, aye, Captain. See, told you it was all made up. You know the name of your own postman. And now it's time for the recipe, which today is ham and cheese snacks. I wouldn't mind having a go at doing that myself. Oh, the mental strain is awful, you know. Here's another idea for a card game. You play it in a car, and all you need is a paper and pencil. As you go over the bumps on the road, you will get a sort of pattern. I wouldn't mind having a go at doing that myself. Today, we're going to see how balloons are being made through the square-ish window. I was a very baby researcher on Play School. It was my first job in television. Ready to knock? They wanted something Turn new and fresh for a new, fresh channel. Play School. What was it like? Wild. It was wild. No one knew what they were doing. We were thinking if Big Ted and Little Ted belonged to the same family, what they could be. Most of those toys were found on the street, you know, in the gutter. Come on, toys. I can't even remember the name of the ugly little female one. What was she called? Hamble. She got up to some very funny things with Teddy in the toy basket. Believe me. Humpty, I want to cross your river. Humpty used to get drop kicked to cross the floor like a rug -a ball because he wouldn't sit up and neither would Jemima. And Jemima down there with... She's got her legs curled up behind her neck. We only had 40 minutes to do a 25-minute programme. And whenever I forgot my lines, I used to look over to Humpty and say, now, Humpty, what's happening next? Because I knew the camera would have to go over to Humpty and be a close-up of Humpty, which gave me thinking time, thinking, oh, what's next? Now it's time to... It was much more relaxed than things that had gone before it. It was much more fun. It was the whole concept of learning through play um, rather, rather than being rather sort of po-faced and serious about things. It was a very embarrassing, humiliating experience. I wanted to do Shakespeare. <laughs> What have we got? Do you remember Play Away? Oh, I love that show. It was variety. It was like being in the theatre. You had to sort of perform. You had to sell yourself to the audience because you had a live audience watching you. Did you hear about the laziest man in the world? 
No. Well, well, when he wanted to clean his teeth, he took his toothbrush like this and watched a tennis match. It really doesn't matter if it's raining or it's fine. Just oh! And to be a lay way, play away, way, play Spin around. When we took play school off, there is a huge outcry, not from the children, but from the adults, because you're taking away something of their childhood. So you're, you're kind of walking a tightrope between keeping things going because the grown-ups remember them and love them, and changing them because children have new needs and new, new likes. Bring back Playaway, bring back Play School, please. Oh, proper children's programs. <laughs> You're reliving the 100 greatest kids' TV shows, the televisual triumphs of the mid-morning of our lives, as voted for by you. Yes, a magical kingdom of hapless hamsters, rude rats, grown men fanning on in tight trunks and posh artists in cravats with plasticine sidekicks. The night is young, even if we're not anymore. Get the cool. Get the cool to shine. Life a Caribbean twist. Drum set, twelve ninety nine online. Amphibian tank, eighty five pounds online. Grocery shopping with extra washing powder, one hundred and thirty pounds online. Shopping without the tears, priceless. There are some things money can't buy. For everything else, there's MasterCard. Accepted everywhere, especially on the internet. Indulge yourself in a refreshing floral fragrance that you can only get from Fairy Liquid. New Fairy Aromatics gently release fresh fragrances throughout the wash. Floral Breeze is just one of the range, also available in Spring Fresh Apple Blossom and Lemon Zest. New Ferry Aromatics, a fresh approach to washing up. Make dry, frizzy hair smooth. Pantene Pro-V introduces smooth and sleek collection. The Pantene Pro-V smoothing formula makes even dry, frizzy hair look healthier and up to 70% smoother. So healthy looking, you'll love your hair. Pantene Pro-V Smooth and Sleek Collection. Imagine if information were water. This is what today might look like. Pretty wet. Got the internet, hundreds of TV channels, add some spin doctors and PR gurus. And we've got a flood on our hands. Who is pulling the strings? What is important these days? If information were water, we'd be drowning. What's important? Today's times. In Hollywood, everyone's a player. Cut. Because everyone wants to make it in the movies. <laughs> this town's all an act. I adore all your movies. <sighs> Thank you. Surely someone can rewrite the script, just like the Toyota Yaris has. It's designed to be individual from the inside out. No, you are kryptonite, baby. You crypto gotta go. I see. It's a whole different act. The Toyota Yaris.
Elvis isn't big anymore. It's Billy, it's Britney. You start as Britney Spears on Monday. They're all very innocent, aren't they, these children's TV shows? You know, another country and people do things differently there. They don't drink, uh, cavort with dirty women, snort coke or fall out of a taxi outside Stringfellow's covered in vomit. <coughs> well, that's what I thought when I was growing up. Time for some clips that make you realise that kids' TV actually was all about sex, drugs and rock and roll. <coughs> Biker Grove was um, a youth club that was set up in Newcastle. And it was uh, set around the lives of, of the teenagers, kind of going from childhood to adulthood and all the dilemmas. It was kind of like a northern Grange Hill, not set in a school but in a youth club. Grange Hill had always distinguished itself by being quite adult, quite quite uh, grown up about some of the issues it tackled, and we wanted to do the same. That's how it's meant to be, isn't it? Proper mum and dad, a nice house. Sam's got you, great. An ex druggy with no fella, no money, and no proper home. Would you want me as your mum? Living in Newcastle, I was particularly aware of the fact that a lot of kids are latchkey kids, have difficult family circumstances, and that the sort of clubs and youth clubs that are set up as places for children to go when they perhaps can't go home immediately after school um, were thriving. I was a little bit of wind to take in love, thinking of the days when you leave me alone, thinking of the days when all was love, thinking of the shout that I wish I'm going Careful, man, Zebedee! Come on, bit! Oh, this is stupid, man. People don't get hit singles just jumping about. Everybody watched Biker Grove. <laughs> yeah, of course I did. I could used to quite fancy you doing that. Glad to see I'm the centre of attention. On the blind you? stage. Oh, just when I was blind. Oh, yeah, I think it was the sympathy vote. Oh, all right. Debbie? Ant and Deck were little diddy boys um, when I remember them uh, at the first round of auditions. Uh, never done any telly before, obviously, just been in school plays and so on, but they seemed a couple of likely lads at the time. And so it proved, and it's wonderful to see them still little diddy lads, but um, rather big successes. This was attached to the brick. What does it say? This is your last warning. If you want to stay healthy, keep off our patch. Somebody was killed, joyriding, drugs. Um, I think they've done pregnancy. pregnancy. They've, do, they've done a lot of really, you know, hard-hitting issues. Oh, come on, more flex dance. Have you been drinking? Have you taken something? Oh, please. You have, have you? You are so stupid. Did she give it to you? Did she? Come on, more flex dance. I'll marry you. Oh, Marcus, get off. It's always managed to mix those tough issues with the fact that it's kids and kids are joyous and optimistic and, and have a lot of fun as well. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats as our main feature is about to start. That did not just happen, right? <laughs> Fearless young orphans protecting Earth's entire galaxy. That show, I think, came out a couple of years after Star Wars. Always five, acting as one. American distributors are looking for anything that had outer space in it, something that can make believe it was a Star Wars type of, you know, saving the galaxy kind of thing. Dedicated, inseparable, invincible. The shows originated in Japan. Those shows were edited so that we could take out the, the 
the violence that was in the shows. We've got to use anti-pluton, but we have to place it just right. Get real close, Tiny. Maybe I can figure out where to aim. The way they replaced the violence was to create a character that was a robot. And the robot would tell the story as it went along, and uh, that filled in the 10 minutes of violence that the shows had. G-Force has defeated the evil Zoltar and driven the forces of Spectra off the planet Zarkadia. My new world is at peace again. After G-Force had, had blown up the evil baddies, at the end of every show, they'd be like a moral. Someday he'll understand. Maybe. But right now, let him work out his anger on me. Some realities are hard to face when you're just a kid. That's uh, very mature of you. So you had all these fantastic scenes in space and battles in space, and then a nice kind of bit of uh, morally parent advice at the end of the show. One of the most exciting phrases any kid could hear at that time was, it's Friday, it's five o'clock, it's Cracker Jack! <laughs> and a half an hour of pure craziness. Get your forces ready, come on and sell your shack. It's Cracker Jack, Cracker Jack, Cracker Jack. Don't leave me on telly, that's what it's all about. Oh, such a lovely word, it's Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack! And we've got a cracker of a programme lined up for you. We have the Dooleys, we have Georgie Payne, we have Double or Drop, we have all sorts of things. A programme of great talent. Cracker Jack was like, you know, a, a junior sort of variety show, really. I mean, they you know, live at the Palladium and all that kind of thing. But that really was the very, you know, they used to have a quiz, they used to have, um, you know, little dramas. My face, prepare to defend yourself! And so I shall. On guard! <laughs> oh. Oh. Ha! So you shall die! Oh, what are we going to do now? There's only one thing we can do. What's that? Tickle each other to death. Peter Glaze was the original Homer Simpson. Um, because Peter Glaze is famous for one thing. Every, every week in, uh, in Cracker Jack, uh, his, his final line would be, do, do, do. He must have said do, do, do. Um, many, many, many times throughout his career. Wampum, wampum! Sing it on the jumper! What is special about the features of a Manx cat? Shh, quiet, please. Double or Drop was uh, Cracker Jack's sort of top quiz element, you know, the game show moment. His tail. What about it? It's no, it's not. He hasn't got one. Basically, television must have been so much simpler then because it was a crap parlour game, you know, and yet the, the nation was riveted. Sorry, darling. <laughs> there are no tails on a Manx cat, so it's a second cabbage over this side. And it's an allegory of the class struggle. When they got something wrong, they were all given cabbages, cabbages being a symbol of their working class backgrounds, and these cabbages would weigh them down, stop them from holding on to the things that they had acquired. <laughs> Helps you, science, because this week's winner has True got Thatcherites hold, were able to Hill, hold on to their goods, winner. avoid the cabbages at all costs, and win through at the end. I really can't understand how Cracker Jack worked. Who writes this rubbish? We do. It's very good, isn't it? And you're thinking, who commissioned that? Who thought this was a good idea? It's taking a poor quality seaside special and doing it for kids. No! It's five o'clock! It's Friday! And it's Cracker Jack! <laughs> Didn't they look young and innocent? Sooty and Sweep are at 38 in the days before their rock star lifestyle took a toll on their youthful looks. <laughs> Got him. After all these years. <laughs> I would just like to say what a privilege it is to be here in the 100 Top Kids programmes. Yeah, it's only natural that I'm included, as I am, without a doubt, one of the most uh, versatile, talented geniuses in showbiz today. Thank you, Rat fans. Yeah. Clever. They're all made of wicks. Great. Superstars always spend lots of money. Anarchic. Boom. Dangerous. Oi, wait a minute. This is my show, this is. Would hate to be on with him, because I know I'd lose. Talking about proper names for things... No, we haven't not... got time. I've got oh. to do the link. Shut up. TVAM was a right load of rubbish, wasn't it? You know, I mean, I came along and saved it because, uh, quite honestly, it was pathetic and it needed somebody with my versatile showbiz personality to take over. Yeah!
Have you woken up yet to the newsmakers on TV AM? Breakfast television was a completely unknown idea. You know she's come all the way from Los Angeles for this interview, don't you? But there were quite a lot of rats around, <laughs> figuratively speaking, around TV AM at the time. And uh, we were on the canal and I thought a rat would be funny. Oh, <clears throat> Good morning, Britain. <laughs> Roland here. The day that Roland went on television and went, Hello, Britain! Um, my husband said, You be careful what you're doing, you know, this is terribly dangerous. Um, but of course, you know, everybody loved it, the children loved it. And, and he got the first million viewers for TVAM. Now it's time once again to hand over to that matinee idol of the sewers, Roland Rat Superstar. <laughs> yeah, Anne Diamond, of course. She fancied me. Uh, she used to work on the yeah, tills at Tesco's like until she was discovered by me. Yeah. I like Anne. She's great, Anne, isn't she? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Incidentally, am I getting paid for this? Light years away, on the far side of the galaxy, lies Ark. It involved three D-list, probably celebs, uh, having to solve puzzles. Go in this way. Go on. No, no. no. Uh, Everything had to be an anagram of the word dragon. Rhonda, Rhonda, your highness. Then you had the, the weird sort of money. One drogner. And the store. Ah. ah. The first was the best one, it was the, the, the purest adventure game, I think. That was when it was hosted partly by Moira Stewart. Get through that door over there, but first you've got to find out which are the safe squares. Mm, yes, there's a puzzle here. Solve it. I'll see you later. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Problem solving was really kind of low rent because it took them kind of two thirds of the show to actually solve the problems. If you knew what my stomach was doing now. <laughs> I don't bounce it because it may fall in the water. I had a big row with a friend of mine recently. I he didn't believe yeah, yeah, yeah. that they actually oh, worked out the puzzles no. themselves, that the celebrities were sort of given a bit of guidance and told what to do. And I said, that's not true at all. Then I got to meet um, Maggie Philbin. There's you a do. plank here <laughs> and there's another barrel. Yes. She confirmed that they had no idea what the puzzles were. Maybe you could come back here with that plank, but don't do it yet. And let's think, if you came back here with the plank, what could we do with it? The final round was the vortex. Oh, what? Yes. If they stepped into the vortex, they got evaporated. Oh! It sounds a bit rubbish, actually, when you say it out loud, doesn't it? But at the time, it was wicked, I think. Very enjoyable. Well, I hope you enjoyed the adventure game and you'll join us again next week to confound and confuse three more time travellers. Until then, goodbye. OK, OK, so, so let's be clear about this, right? There was a beagle called Fleagal, a gorilla called Bingo, an elephant called Snorky and a lion called Drooper. Oh, and the lion had his own dear Drooper part of the show where he dished out advice to kids. Do you think young people really needed drugs in the 60s when they had shows like this? Jumping, we'll take you for a spin and show you round the wheelie world. Making characters walk is a very slow and expensive process, so as it happened, they'd been born with wheels instead and trundled about quite happily and they had ramps to go up and down. It was very PC, really, you know. <laughs> we'll show you all the sights of Wheelie World. The Wicked Witch, Fenella. Inside her kettle base had a book stand, and on the book stand was this huge tome. Fritz von Spildebeens, the talking spellbook, who uh, gave uh, Fenella her useless uh, spells which never worked. A rotten spell I keep within my pages deep will turn the dragon into smoke. And send them back to sleep, oh, they're lovely. On the front of the book, because it was a magic book, it should have had the pentagram. Unfortunately, the artist who was supposed to be making the book was not very good at drawing five-sided stars, so he drew a six-sided star, and subsequently they sold the program to Israel. I'll tell you now what the magic spiel is. Uh, the people who were watching the show saw this as the Star of David. They heard the German voice coming out of it. And they were charging us with all sorts of anti-Semitic sentiments. Oh, oh. <laughs> hey, up have you lost your wheels? I know how are you. I have to say, as in so many cases, we were innocent to the point of gormlessness and no harm was intended. Um, any room for, uh, any room for a little one in there? 
You're not filming this, are you? Now, my name is Roy North, and during the show, I shall be introducing the guest artists, singing a few songs, cracking a few gags. I say, aren't plums cheap? Pardon? I said, aren't plums cheap? What are you saying that for? Well, I thought I'd better say something. It is my shoe, you know. <laughs> I know it is, Basil, and I've really been looking forward to this. Oh, thank you, Mr. South. Marvellous. <laughs> North? Oh, I'm sorry, I lost my sense of direction. <laughs> <laughs> boom, boom! <laughs> Sunny day, sleep in the Sesame Street came on the air in 1969. It was like nothing anyone had ever seen before. Sally, you've never seen a street like Sesame Street. Everything happens here. You're going to love it. Sesame Street took place in a Brooklyn neighborhood with brownstones and garbage cans. And when we look back on it from today's perspective, it may not seem so radical. At the time, that was insane. Hey, you out there in TV land, everybody watch. This is 1969. Robert Kennedy had been killed. Martin Luther King had been killed in 68. There were riots. We had riots all over this country, burning cities. Every night, the news was bringing you more bad news. And I said that people stood there and said to the TV set, so do something. Everybody wash your ears. Sesame Street was considered groundbreaking for a number of reasons. This amount of money had never been spent on a children's television program. This was adult budget. I can do most anything, roller skating while I sing. See the world my special way, turn it upside down today. It was groundbreaking because nobody had ever said, let's use commercials that are selling products to, quote, sell letters and numbers. Some people felt that because it had a fast style and a kind of psychedelic style sometimes, that it would get kids turned on to acid and onto drugs, that television was like a, like a drug trip, and Sesame Street was the worst example of a kind of drug trip. Bert, can you bring me a bar of soap? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah but, uh, just, just toss it into a rosy here. Bert and Ernie, um, with big eyebrows, um, who lived a very strange sort of almost um, gay couple existence. Who's Rosie? My bathtub. I call my bathtub Rosie. It was rather like the odd couple, or or Eric and Ernie. You know, Morecambe and Wise. They used to sleep in the same bed together in their sketches. Ernie, why do you call your bathtub Rosie? What's that? I said, why do you call your bathtub Rosie? Because every time I take a bath, I leave a ring around Rosie. <laughs> Ernie, get out of the tub. Thank you for allowing a monster into your living room. Mm. Okay, tootsie, bye, mommy. Toot, tootsie, footsie, ice cream, ice cream. You know what, honey? No, no, get out, get out, get out. Once we knew we had Jim Henson as our master puppeteer, we knew that we had an, an element that would appeal to adults. <laughs> My granddaughter, when she was nine months old, used to try to hug the TV set whenever Elmo would come on, or pat the glass to see if she could feel the, feel the fur that she knew was there from her dolls, her Elmo dolls. But it's an amazing phenomenon. It's just amazing. You're watching the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows, brought to you by the letter C and the number 4. And all voted for by you, the viewers. What old friendships we've renewed here tonight. And what fascinating tales we still have to tell. For instance, 
I've always wanted to know why sweep squeaks instead of barks. I don't... what? Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. He's been done by the vet. Get the cool... Get the cool... Hold that tiger, hold that tiger, hold that tiger. Where's that tiger? Where's that tiger? Where's that tiger? The Vauxhall Astra SRI with sports suspension handles life beautifully. I'll get this out of your way, Les, alright? We should move more often, it's such fun. Can't afford this, can't we? Of course not. What? Curry's have arrived. Oh, that's one thing taken care of. At Curry's, we're taking the worry out of electrical shopping, keeping prices down week in, week out, to bring you no worries, low prices right across the store. We'll build the extension out over the garage. And... Oh! Like this 1400 spin washing machine at under £300. Just when you need it. Sorry. Curries. No worries. Honey! There is another way to cool down this summer. McDonald's delicious new Strawberry Crunch McFlurry. You must have some strong. Seven ninety nine plus forty eight. Borrow one from Barbara. Take off the doodah. Hang on. Three little piggies. One went. At Tesco, nine. our back to school range is at our lowest possible price. Incredible. Eighteen pounds forty five. Hmm? Tesco. Every little house. The first rule of boxing is control. It's not about losing it with someone. It's about keeping your composure. But if I was called out to a home where it seems a man was using his fist on a woman, beating her up over some domestic row, I don't know if I could keep my cool with that man. I couldn't swear to that. From just 11,595 and with 0% finance over three years, the Vauxhall Astra SXI handles life beautifully. Get the cool. Welcome back to the 100 greatest kids TV shows. Wave after wave of childhood nostalgia. In fact, it's like drowning and watching your life pass in front of you. Except it's just the first few years of your life and it's taking three hours. That's very slow drowning. Blue Peter, you feel, was run by parents and teachers. You know, they were, they were sneaking in education. You know, even an hour after school's finished, they were still trying to educate you. <laughs> Each new head of children's programmes who goes in thinks, I mean, I've been there such a long time, I ought to do something about this. And I thought this when I went in as head of children. I thought, really must tackle Blue Peter. And then you realise that it is absolutely at the heart of the schedule.
feel now I was conned. I should have been watching Magpie, which is for cooler kids. If you're happy and you know, say we are, we are. If you're happy and you know, say we are, we are. Blue Peter was awful. I used to hate, even as a kid, I hated Blue Peter. It was awful. It was so twee. It was so staid. It was so full of nice little children pretending they liked butterfly collecting one. I just found it so dull. Sit down. Sit down. Good boy. Stay there. No kids watch Blue Peter. That's a fact. No one watches it. Um, and it's that dodgy five past five slot on BBC where they get, they start doing things with slightly older kids. But they just get it really, really wrong, I think. My driver was John Blocky, who became British champion a week after he took me down the run. John was giving me the ride of a lifetime. We shot round every corner perfectly and got our speed up to around 90 miles an hour. But we didn't know that ahead of us there was a hole in the ice wall and by a million to one chance, we hit it. That's a bad. <laughs> I couldn't... I couldn't get out of the, no, the sledge, yeah. yeah. Well, well, actually, the, the, the best bit, really, is my hip. You ought, you ought to see this. How, how about this for a, a brooms? Where is it? Oh, there. there it is. That's nice. Oh, you okay. slid a long way on that, didn't you? I did, yeah. I think I used to drive my mum a bit mad when I watched Blue Peter, because I'd always want to either start making cakes or asking, giving her a big list of stuff that I needed from the shop that was going to come to about 20 quid. <laughs> That's for you. You don't do yourself justice, you know. It's actually very light. Uh, anybody got an electric saw? Well, let's take that. Well, I was hormonally challenged by Blue Peter because, first of all, it was Valerie Singleton. I had a big thing about her. Big thing about Leslie Judd. Oh. <laughs> what have I got left? <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty amazing, I can tell you. And I don't know what kind of elemental hell I was going through, but, I mean, the teachers at my primary school, they were ugly. And so, therefore, that was pretty much the only female role model I had to fall in love with. <laughs> Next up, Rhubarb and Custard, the wobbly tea time cartoon that looked like it was drawn on the bus going into work. Jamie, Jamie, Jamie and the Magic Torch. You shine a torch on the floor, create a hole, like a magic hole, it's a magic torch, obviously. Then he'd go through the hole and then appear in this magic land. We had bits of psychedelia uh, and bits of trendiness. And we picked, I mean, we picked up uh, influences wherever they were lying about. What a magical place, and it's light as day. Oh, ah, you be right, Master Jamie, said Wordsworth who found, without too much surprise, that down here in Cuckoo Land, he could talk. Finding the voices for the characters is, I suppose, a whole series of, of associations. Mr. Boo is going to be obvious because he's effectively a mad professor. So, uh, I mean, all mad professors talk in a strange voice and have glasses on the end of their nose and say, oh dear, they seem to have got that slightly boom wrong. <laughs> 42,009 and 42,010 leaves uh, one. I knew it. I'm one short. I was old and young and a Gloucestershire dog. Oh, uh, that's the way they talk. If you've ever talked to an old English sheepdog, you'd know. Oh, careful now, Master Jamie. We don't want to lose him. Don't worry, Wordsworth. And in no time at all, Mr. Boo was airborne. Now that, to me, as a child, was just the best. And no torch I ever tried would do that. <coughs> time to go home, Master Jamie. And there was the tree. Ah, thought Wordsworth. I liked my own bed. That's a great show. Top Cat was a great show, but I wonder about the bloke who first pitched it to the, to the network. The indisputable leader of the game. You know, like Sergeant Bilko? Well, yeah, it's, it's sort of like that, and I went, oh, good. It's Wisecracker, he's in charge, he's in the army. He's not in the army, no. He's sort of in a, in a gang, a street gang. They go, oh, current, good. Brilliant. We love it. There's one other thing. Go on. It's cartoon cats instead of people. All right? He's the most dip top, top cat. Yes, he's a chief, he's a king, but above everything, he's the most dip top.
SMTV is the first Saturday morning programme that's had the, the adult stroke children appeal since Tis was. Ant and Deck are the best thing that's happened to kids TV, actually to TV, uh, in this country for a long time. And I'm Deck. We met yeah, once before we actually this. started the series. We actually, um, we met up with Kat and we just knew straight away that we clicked and we were going to be friends. What have you got? <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> the main thing when we started was not to talk down to kids or, or patronise them. Hello, where are the beautiful cores? <laughs> I'm the stunningly beautiful Sharon. I'm the outstandingly beautiful Andrea. And I'm the breathtakingly beautiful Caroline. <laughs> and I'm the not so beautiful Jim. Shut your face there, Jim. They're your mates, and I think that the way that their relationship works, you feel that you've been welcomed into it, and you can kind of play a part in that whole banter yourself. People often ask us, how can we be as beautiful as the beautiful chorus? Oh, the beautiful, beautiful chorus. And we say to them, everybody is beautiful. Just most people aren't as beautiful as us, the beautiful pores. <laughs> beautiful. They clearly enjoy doing the programme. I think it's the sort of programme where if they weren't enjoying it, it just wouldn't be made. Right, I'm off to practice. Okay. See you later. Bye. <laughs> we intentionally try and push the boundaries um, all of the time and try and you know, some of the things we do are a bit saucy and a bit, you know, funny. And, and, and people say, can you get away with that on Saturday morning telly, on kids' telly? And we don't know if we can a lot of the time, but we just try it. Chums is sponsored by Tyler's Dual Purpose Toilet. Whether you're making a cake or making it smell, choose a Tyler's. Can I lick the bowl clean, Mummy? Yes! The cat dealy uh, aspect to that programme. So, you know, you've got your dads sitting at home there watching it with their kids and there's a little bit of a special appeal there, if you know what I mean. No more late nights out with the lads, no more chasing leggy, blonde, big-chested models around seedy nightclubs, is that what you mean? Yes, and you've got to change too. I will. Anton Deck and Kat, the three of them, they've kind of made a programme that isn't really children's TV, it's just... If you get the joke, you get the joke. And something like Chums, there's a joke on every single level. If you're a five-year-old, you can think it's funny. If you're 50, there might be a gag in there for you. If you're 25, it's funny as well. And come on now, I've told you before, this really has to stop. Thomas the Tank Engine steams straight into our chart at number 26. Thank God the Reverend Audrey dreamt him up before privatisation, otherwise Thomas would probably be stuck somewhere between Doncaster and York, and the fat controller would have walked off with his half a million pound golden handshake. Some progress, eh? Wow, you're late, and that smell is making me ill. I can't help it, it's the fish, replied Thomas. And a very good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome indeed to another edition of Jim All Fix It. If you want to sit in the mastermind chair or stand on an aeroplane's wing in the air If you want to play the slide trombone or operate a telephone If you want to read the classified scores or if you want to take the floor I talk about Jim will fix it without the kids on the ride at Blackpool Pleasure Beach. Come on, boys, gather round, gather round. You know why this is a special day, boys? Yes! They were all sat down and they were all eating the lunch. Five, four, three, two, one. And there's milkshakes, sandwiches, sausage rolls everywhere. Absolutely hilarious. <laughs> My 
favourite was the little fat chubby one. <laughs> His little chubby cheeks would go like that while he was on the revolution and his drink went all over his face. And I just thought, I'm going to get that now at school for the rest of my life and look like the fat kid from the roller coaster. Brilliant. What do you think? Have they deserved their Jim will fix it badge? They never said no. No, they were crap. Five. My name's Virgil, and I'm a bisexual. Four. I would like to sleep with Lady Penelope. Three. In her pink car. Two. With Parker. One. That'd be nice. Thunderbirds are go. It has a unique look because of this crazy combination of puppet special effects and science fiction. OK, boys, that's the brief. It's our first assignment, so make it good. As you know, your uniforms are in your craft and must only be worn on call. Right, Father. For somebody who wanted to be a Steven Spielberg, um, it was pretty grim when I was asked to make puppet films. I really had no interest in puppets at all. So what I did was to make the puppet film as good as possible and as near to live action as possible. Enough explosives to smash the atomic reactor. Thinking that the broadcasters would say we would give him something like a, a live action series, but of course the reverse happened. The better the puppet film, the more I got. Jolly good show, old boy. And what a show. Are you okay, Virgil? At the time, it was virtually impossible to sell a British show to America. International Rescue. Lady Penelope speaking. Require your assistance. Man they would say that they couldn't understand our accents, uh, so we used um, American voices. Well, she's got a good start, Kirano. An education in the finest American university and a European tour to her credit. So that when the shows went to America, they thought they were American shows and they bought them. <laughs> Telephone for you, me lady. Hovis? Yes, me lady. Why do you speak in that ridiculous accent? <laughs> it's the American idea of how the lower class Britisher speaks, me lady. We're closing in on him, me lady. Good, Parker. For the first time, you get a good, strong female role, role model, which is uh, Lady Penelope. Mobile control, FAB. And actually has a male employee to boss about, and technically has her own career, is wealthy in her own right. You called, m'lady? Who's a strange cross between uh, Barbara Cartland and Mrs Thatcher. Go ahead, Parker. In today's money, Thunderbirds cost a million pounds an episode. There's nothing anywhere in the world not only now, but over the past 35 years, that has the look of Thunderbirds. It's totally, totally unique. Boys, I think we're in business. Postman Pat, Postman Pat, Postman Pat and his black and white cat. Here comes a real British superhero, Postman Pat. He delivers letters. He drives a red van. He has a cat. We had three-day weeks and strikes. <laughs> Bin bags piling up. Bodies waiting to go to the morgue. Pew, pew, Barney McGrew, Tuffet, Dibble, Grub. But not in Trumpton. It was always lovely there. People get quite upset when they have bets in pubs and these as to whether it's Hugh Pew, because they hadn't realised they were twin brothers, you see. <laughs> Fireman Pew and Pew, sir, sir. Gordon Murray wrote them, directed them. Gordon was quite canny because he shot them all in colour when at that time there was only black and white television and he had it in his mind that it was worth paying out for the colour. 
and it's paid off because they're still going, still showing. Pasting up the posters, sticking up the bills, putting up advertisements for sausages and pills, flower shows and concerts, you can take your pick, all neatly stuck by Bill Sticker Nick. Gordon took it upon himself, well, they did belong to him, to burn all the figures and, I think, all the sets because he didn't want anyone else to get their hands on them, which is a bit of a shame. I could have done with just one as a little pension. You're watching the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows, and I'd just like to mention... Get the cool. wants to expose their child to unnecessary danger. Yet measles, mumps and rubella can still be a serious threat. Finding out the facts about MMR will help you protect your child. So for advice or a leaflet, contact your health visitor, local surgery or call NHS Direct on 08 45 46 47. A Caribbean twist. And you can also get movie tickets, magazines, family outings, even ferry trips like this one, which my daughter Kate organised for us. Actually, where is Kate? With over 150 deals to spend your points on, it's never been easier to spoil yourself with Tesco's new club card. Tesco. Every little helps. You've got a sweat on for 88. You can feel your heart pounding. Ten seconds can seem like hours. Mecca Bingo. Call now for free membership. Your body temperature fluctuates slightly when you have your period, and you may feel the heat more. That's why new Always Ultra are absorbent, and unlike other pads, they're now breathable, so they're the driest Always pads ever. At least that's one less thing to get steamed up about. Always talking your body's language. Potty training is a big step. New Huggies pull-ups help make it easier. They look feel and go up and down like real pants and they're absorbent so if there's a little accident no problem in pull up she knows she's out of nappies and starts to feel quite grown up pull ups end of nappies start of pants with a remarkably low center of gravity and the longest wheelbase in its class. The Ford car has incredibly secure handling. Stay glued to the road from 6,960 pounds, including one year's free insurance and 0% finance. The Ford car from just 6,960 pounds. Ford demands a closer look. Welcome back to the 100 Greatest Kids TV Shows. 
The secret garden of children's television for those of us who can plot our lives by Doctor Who's assistants and Blue Peter tortoises. Some things, though, have always stayed the same. Always have done. Always will. Blimey. I think that stuff I got off of Mr. Ben's shopkeeper is really starting to kick in. Mud. Mud. All over the street, it sticks to your feet. It's mud. Oh, yes. Mud. Ned Murray with Tony Robinson. Raffle tickets. Who will buy a raffle ticket? Fabulous prizes. Cretin, what are your fabulous prizes? Um, a fabulous box of mud. Twelve fabulous bottles of mud and a fortnight's holiday for two. Where is some mud? Tony Robinson played this, like, really dirty, filthy... A bit like Baldrick, I think. Bullseye! What a shot, eh? <laughs> it was really, really funny. All the gags were spot on. And, of course, Maid Marion was very attractive. Pardon? See what a lusty staff I have. Look, I don't want to be rude, uh, Mr Ron. But it's a very large bridge, and quite frankly, you're not exactly massive, are you? This will go down in history as one of the best TV shows ever for kids. Wasn't it funny? Wasn't it the most hysterically humorous thing you've ever seen in your entire lives? Hey, you young man, I'm talking to you. Into the top 20, and what a career curve for John Pertwee. One minute, you're a Time Lord. The next, you're a scarecrow with a pole stuck up your Aunt Sally. Can we get away with that? Good evening, young man. Good, good evening. Sir. Good evening, sir. That's what you should say. Me being older than you. Sorry. Good evening, sir. It's well, either that, or as it may be, a good evening, Mr. Gummidge. And that being my name. I still think it's it's one of the great ideas uh, that that Bill and Joe have had. Never, never do. Flintstones meet the Flintstones. Putting on a sitcom show uh, based on contemporary. Uh, values with that twist, that wonderful twist of, of, of using prehistoric gimmickry. The Flintstones was unique as a nighttime, primetime cartoon for the whole family that was a half hour length. It wasn't like the old style eight minute cartoon you used to see in movie theaters. And it was kind of based on a sitcom format, which was quite unique at the time. Wilma, start packing plenty of sandwiches, eh? What? Fred, one, just one. Will you try to forget that stomach of yours? <laughs> oh, that, that's asking him to forget an awful lot, Wilma. <laughs> <laughs> Fred was a bit divvy, uh, and Barney was a bit divvy, but Barney was, Barney's wife was hot, you know. He was banging a real hot cartoon chick. He was obviously getting it regular, and he was just like, oh, OK, Fred. He didn't care what Fred wanted to do, because at the end of the day, he'd go home and have it hot with this cartoon woman. Um, and as a child, I thought, you know, when I grow up, that's the kind of woman I'd like. It was on TV at 20 to 6, and the news began at quarter to 6. So everybody would be settled down with cups of tea and biscuits and whatever else, and it would be, shut up, kids, and watch the Wombles. I was given free reign completely with the voices. And the voices were easy, in a way, because all I had to do was to read the script by Liza Beresford. Um, and then look at the puppets, and you've got the hierarchy and everything, and it was all there for you. Tomsk, Wellington, and Bungo are ready to start work. And here's great uncle Bulgaria. I like Bulgaria very much. And I suppose he would have been my favorite. Hmm? Where is Orinoco? The kids absolutely adored Orinoco, and I reckon that was because he was a skiver. He was always nicking off and playing truant. <laughs> Sorry, I was 
just having an extra 40 winks. I just have 40 winks. <laughs> mm. They prided themselves on having a very egalitarian society, uh, that they were organised, they were into teamwork. Yes, I'll go down here. <laughs> yes, stand at the end. And they were terribly multicultural. They were all named after places on Uncle Bulgaria's map of the world. You'll have to work extra hard today because of the strong wind. And don't forget to bring me a copy of today's Times newspaper as soon as you find one. Now, to work. They only used things that the everyday folk left behind. Tomsk is busy already. They never kind of sold out from that and moved on to only using things that the middle class has left behind. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Help. They did cause a lot of problems, I'm told, in Wimbledon on the common, because children actually thought that they were real. They had to be dissuaded from walking about with a bag full of rubbish, throwing it under bushes in the hopes that a womble would pop out and pick it up. What? Oh, good gracious me. Today's times. Well done, Orinoco. Who is this superhero? Sarge? No. Rosemary, the telephone operator? No. Henry, the mild-mannered janitor? Could be. Hong Kong Fooey, number one super guy. The thing about Hong Kong Fooey was that not only was he a dog, but he was also a janitor. When he was at work, he was doing very little. It was just a broom. There was no polishing, no wiping down. Fair enough, I'd rather have crime-free streets than like a clean office, but why not replace him? Why not get a real cleaner in and let him do crime fighting? It was just the most exciting thing. It was virtual reality on TV. I think it was the first time that had been done. It was sort of Dungeons and Dragons and Goblins and Trolls and, you know, nerdy Pratchett stuff like that. Um, and it was quite witty as well. Welcome, Watchers of Illusion, to the Castle of Confusion. You'd have these jobbing actors coming in, who I'm sure, you know, more than embarrassed by it, pretend to be a jester and stuff and being a bit wacky and giving clues and stuff. There is no correct route through the dungeon, but the right path can be found using logic and guile. Turn then, face the door, and take a step forward. Where am I? You're in a reasonably large room. Ahead of you on the wall, there are two doors with portcullises in them. It was the first right intelligent game show for kids, I would say. The first one where kids actually had to think. There's a bomb lighted, David, OK? You might All right. explode anything getting through Step that. forward, one step. Turn left. Walk forward. Walk forward. Run another one. Another one, quickly. Quickly, quick. quickly. quickly. Another one. Bomb explosion. Just one step. It was actually kids having to work out logistical problems and doing things. It was good, I think. Farewell, David. You did well, but I'm afraid you came an awful cropper. It's funny, Wallace and Gromit have just grown on me all the time, and the longer it, I spend away from them, the more I think about them. <laughs> the timing of it's brilliant, the script's brilliant, the characters are fantastic. Wallace and Gromit is, in terms of animation, is just an absolutely phenomenal achievement. They started off as an idea for a kid's book, and uh, originally Gromit was a cat. And um, it was when I made it in plasticine, I found that a dog seems to suit plasticine better than a cat. Wallace, you would think, with that bizarre mouth, that uh, it wouldn't really be possible to, to have a a character with, with many sort of visual expressions, you know. In order to get his mouth wide enough, I've got to... I've first of all, I've got to get those teeth out. 
And this is where I am in danger of moving the entire set. Uh -huh. Well, that went as well as could be expected, didn't it? Whoa! It's the wrong trousers, Gromit, and they've gone wrong. Stop them, Gromit! Stop them! Help me, Gr Gromit! You can make the figures do what any cartoon can do and because you've got that flexibility to, you know, to squash and flatten and, you know, have characters whizzing through the air and... At the same time, you can light it to look like a, a live-action movie. There's a sequence when Gromit's following the penguin through the street and it's lit like, you know, many kind of film noir movies that I used to watch on a Sunday afternoon. I had this idea for a train chase that would take place on the living room floor, on the model train. We had, you know, miles of this track going around the studio, and we had a set, you know, which was about 20 or 30 feet long. Oh! Hang in there, Gromit! Everything's under control! Well, the whole sequence took about three months to shoot. That, if you don't mind, eh? Comic timing is probably the most essential element. That's what you can do with animation that, that is very hard to achieve with any other medium. Because you can time everything precisely and plan it and, um, and execute it just at the right time. We're in the middle of writing a feature length film with Wallace and Gromit right now ready to go into production in about a year or so. So we haven't seen the last of them. That's a boy, Gromit, lad. Well done. We did it. <laughs> For 60 years, they've been playing cat and mouse with us. The original Itchy and Scratchy, Tom and Jerry, have won an amazing seven Oscars. Bet they can't agree on who gets to keep them, though. The BBC wanted a new series for small children and they liked the idea of doing a space series. So, you know, the problem was what sort of space series would be suitable for small children. We didn't want battles in space and all that sort of thing. And there is one family, there's a family of clangers, there's Major, there's Mother, there's Tiny and Small. And of course, there's also the Soup Dragon. Just what is that, and what is it doing there? The scripts were fully written out, like and then that. Oliver Postgate and Stephen Sylvester sat down with their swanny whistles and, and whistled it, so that, you know, you, got, you could really understand almost what they were saying. <whistles> In fact, when Oliver and I went to Germany, Oliver showed them this film with no voices, just the, the actual whistles. And he said, I don't suppose you understood what was going on. And, and the German said, oh, yes, they are speaking perfect German. <laughs> so if, whatever language people speak, they seem to think that the clangers are speaking their language. <laughs> what came through in the clangers, I think, was Oliver's own ideas about peace, about living with your neighbours, about, you know, treating people with respect. And there's a lot of love in there, and I think the message comes through, really. Good night, chicken. Good night, tiny clanger. If your mansion house needs haunting, just call Rent-A-Ghost. Yes, at number 12, The Exorcist meets the Chuckle Brothers in the shape of Rent-A-Ghost. Hilarious slapstick, that Timothy Claypole character, and uh, Audrey Roberts out of Coronation Street. You do not understand. I wish to make a proposal to all of you. But you cannot marry all three of us. That would be big of you. Big, big on me. me. That's what I say. Well, that's the weather, and now late night lineup. <laughs> Oh, 
some time ago, the magic roundabout was moved to an earlier time of five to five, and a flood of letters poured into junior points of view. Here are just a few of them. I am a dedicated Doodle fan, and I may probably never see him again. In order to be home for this program. Yours in anticipation. We beg you to reconsider and return the magic roundabout to its original time. Trouble on the telly? Hector's house on fire? Baba gone home to Africa? We've got to find an announcer, said Florence, or no one will know what's going on. What he totally ignored were the French scripts which were sent to him, but thrown out. He threw practically everything that was French out. He didn't approve of the French. So he just worked from the pictures. Wake up, said Dougal. The ice age is upon us. The French were a bit upset. They thought that he had called the dog de Gaulle, so that it was a kind of, he was being cheeky about their, <laughs> their politics. The weather forecast is as follows. If I lie down, it'll rain. I'm supposed to be Ermintrude the cow, but I think that's just because I call everybody darling because my memory has never been good. Was I lovely? In my school playground, the rumour about Magic Roundabout was that each character was based on an addict to a particular kind of drug. Drugs? Dougal was the speed freak, always hoovering up the sugar. Dylan was on hash. Zebedee was on acid. Ermintrude must have been on the Magic Mushroom because she was eating stuff from the ground and her eyes would spin round and round and round. So that was the theory, although I'm sure Mr Thompson would see it differently. Absolute rubbish. I don't think Thompson even popped an aspirin. Uh, friends, said Florence. Uh, viewers, she said. Time for bed, she said. I loved the music. And my youngest daughter, I led her up the aisle to the strains of Magic Roundabout, which got an enormous laugh, which was very helpful for a marriage ceremony. <laughs> Time to rest just once more before we finish our long, long journey. The magical roundabout is slowing to a stop. Our odyssey is almost at an end. But we hope you'll return home with some treasured souvenir from this adventure. Just like Mr Ben at the end of every episode. You'd have thought by now the shopkeeper would have noticed half his stock missing, wouldn't you? Get the cool. Get the cool to shine. Deliciously tempting in over 19 wicked varieties. That's Muller Corners. Mum, Mum, I forgot my lunch box. Mum, what do I do? Well, there's motherly love and there's Muller love. Bow your head! The film that rules the planet is the number one movie in the country. It's the best event movie of the summer. All out, unadulterated fun. Five stars. Unmissable, cool, constantly exciting. Play dead. Planet of the Apes. Real American heroes. Budweiser salutes you, Mr. Footlong Hot Dog Inventor. Mr. Footlong Hot Dog Inventor. When conventional wisdom said no one could make a hot dog longer than six inches, you dared to dream. Dared to dream. The crowd cheered your 10 inch wiener. Wait, you said, I can give you two more inches. Oh. So this bud's for you, mister, for giving us all a bigger wiener. Thank you. For the most comfortable feeling ever, try Charmin Ultra. The most cushiony soft paper ever. There's a cereal for the way you live. For the real you inside. Oh, please. All we need to know is that Weetabix Advantage is naturally low in fat, high in fibre, and it doesn't taste like a gravel drive. So is that your first meal this year, yeah? Look, it won't make your bum magically disappear. It can give you an advantage, but it can't do miracles. Statistics show that a cat's immune system declines by age seven, and that by age eight, 
it could be just half the strength of a two-year-old cat. Forget statistics, because now there's IAMS. IAMS Senior is proven to take the immune system of an eight-year-old to the level of a much younger adult cat. IAMS gives your cat complete and balanced nutrition in every stage of her life, day by day, for a long, active time together. Welcome to a new world of health, IAMS. In a virtual world, it's difficult to do justice to the Ford Fiesta's incredibly smooth ride and secure handling. In the real world, you just have to take it on the road. And the reality is, with 0% finance available and a three-year warranty, you can do just that from £6,995. Ford demands a closer look. Blockbuster has the latest movies long before they're on cable or satellite, so you can take them home on video or DVD. This week, take home the terrifying Hannibal, the eagerly awaited return of Dr. Lecter. At Blockbuster, we buy more copies than anyone else, and if you rent Hannibal now, you can buy Silence of the Lambs on video for only $3.99. Blockbuster, bringing entertainment home. Could you give up your Western lifestyle for 10 weeks in Africa? You are not allowed to eat eggs, meat, milk from the cows. Get the cool. Get the cool. Praise the Lord and pass the sticky back plastic. It's time for the top 10 greatest kids TV shows of all time. Shows whose stars burn ever brightly. Shows as good today as they ever were. Shows that are now widely available in Woolies for $9.99 with their logos embossed on Taiwanese lunchboxes. And the masters of the universe! It was a very unusual kids' programme in that the hero had very few vulnerabilities. When the hero picked up his sword and said, By the power of Greyskull! He basically then just slept, slew all the baddies. The real story is Mattel toys. That hook won't stop He-Man. It was the first show where uh, a manufacturer, a toy company, put money into a cartoon show and it was a big campaign to sell to kids. Now may the mightiest warrior win. Buzz off and whiplash. Figures from the Masters of the Universe collection from Mattel. You can't produce 65 episodes of an animated show if you don't already have money and if you're not sure it's going to succeed. How do you make sure it's going to succeed? You already have a toy that's very successful, therefore it's a safe investment to pump a whole bunch of money into making 65 episodes promoting that toy. Get away, He-Man! I have a score to settle with Skeletor. There wasn't this kind of thing you get with Spider-Man where he'd, he'd, he'd run out of his powers or he'd get captured. It was always just this relentless march of victory. Thanks, He-Man! You could see this kind of in America at the time, in the 1980s, uh, when America was trying to take on the Soviet Union, present itself as this force for good against the evil empire. Very much this, you know, here we are, here's our sword, here's our strength, here's our power, and we're the masters of the universe. So you could see it's quite scary. <laughs> Ranger became the mighty battle cat, and I became He-Man, the most powerful man in the universe. Yes, Muffin. I'm sorry, too. I understand you have a little program idea called... Drew. It's, um... Talk to who, sir? It's a wonderful format for, for a television program because it can be anything and everything from it's, it's been a cowboy program, it's been historical, it's been hysterical, it's been forward in its thinking, it's been, you know, uh, sideways and upside down in its thinking. Humans on the bridge! I'm not human! Spot Delta on the hip. I was afraid of the Daleks. I didn't actually go to the lengths of hiding behind the settee, but I think if I met one today, I would still be scared. Retreat! It was the thought that there was someone in there, and that person was rather sinister. My lure has worked! I can order Daleks to detain him! No! Davros was absolutely terrifying. Give me the greater pleasure to watch his own curiosity deliver him into my hands! This horrible, sort of bold face, it was all snarled and, oh, it was awful. How long do you envisage the show running? 
26 years. The best bit was the regeneration thing when one doctor would change into another and it happened so rarely, it was really special. Oh, so you're my replacements. <laughs> a dandy and a clown. That's the trouble with regeneration. You never quite know what you're going to get. And you were just dying to see who the new Doctor Who would be. And then you'd be sitting there with all your mates going, it's not as good as the old one. I wrote a letter to, to the BBC when I was very young asking how each Doctor regenerated. And I just wrote back saying, yes, Ian, uh, each Doctor regenerates. I suggest you look this up in a dictionary. Yours, people at the BBC. I thought, you miserable sods. I don't want to do this show unless we get the most charismatic, talented actors to play the Doctor. For the whole 26 years? Yeah, towards the end, just any old f the equity card. It was the first of those teenage detective shows. Man's best friend is a dog. It was really spooky and creepy. I wonder if they ever got up to anything sexual. Scooboo buddy, old friend, old pal, if you'll do that favor for me, I'll do something for you too. Scooby dooby doo, where are you? We need some help from you now. Come on, Scooby doo, I see you. And they wanted a hippie to play Shaggy. And I wasn't sure I could do a hippie. And they kept calling me back, though, and after the third callback, they decided I was, I was the voice of Shaggy. Bail us out of these hay bales. <laughs> first thing first. <laughs> oh? Zoinks! It's Mr. Carswell, the bank president. Every single week, they think it's a ghost, but it turns out, oh, it's just Mr. Simmons from the fair. Or, you know, it was the only person they met in the whole episode. We've been doing this every week for five years, and it's never a ghost. It's always the bloke who owns the property that's being haunted. Why don't we just go straight to him? <laughs> There's the creeper. Well, I'll be. You kids have certainly wound up all the loose ends in this case. Blasted meddling kids. Meddling kids. Pesky kids. You meddling kids. Scoob, old buddy, old friend, old pal. They would have gotten away with it if it weren't for us pesky kids. Huh? <laughs> I thought it was going to be a six weeks job. <laughs> 20 years later. Up above the streets and houses, rainbow climbing high. Everyone can see it smiling over the sky. Zippy, George and Bungle always got them very well together as characters. Pardon, Zippy. How would you make a sick pig better? You rub its chest with ointment. Was he supposed to be Zippy? Um, I don't know. <laughs> a comedian! Oh, well, that's what I want to be! People ask me sometimes, what did I base the voice on? I used to say Margaret Thatcher and Ian Cross between Margaret Thatcher and Ian Paisley. <laughs> don't you think that's funny? No, I don't. George was very cuddly, um, very sweet. And he was a fella. I mean, some people think he was uh, uh, possibly a girl, but no. He, I always thought of him as a, as a guy. Hello, John. <laughs> Hello, Bobby. <laughs> what are you going to do me now? <laughs> yes, I am. George from Rainbow, I mean, he was this pink hippo. I seem to remember he had these big eyelashes that he'd bat all the time, and he was, you know, slightly more butch than Julian Clary, but he was just... He was just screaming, basically. <laughs> Give me a kiss. Oh, a kiss. Oh, I'm a bit shy. <laughs> People say, oh, you don't do both the voices. And I used to say, yes, I do. And they say, oh, well, you do them separately. And I said, no. Because I used to love it when I got to script when they'd have an argument. But he goes funny, Joe. You are so do I. Oh, now you shut up, George Cushion. No, I'm not good. Yes, you are. No, I'm not. Because if now listen, I'm weak. I can't tell you what. Well, come on. What do? Short-sighted ghost way. Spooktacles. The bed became a big joke, and who was going on the outside? And yes, it, I suppose I can say this. We used to have joke about old Zippy's fart, and oh, it's not me, it's George. <laughs> that this sort of thing happened. Yes. Snuggle down, and Zippy, don't keep everybody awake with your jokes. As characters, I don't know if I got too attached to them. They were, they were just. Uh, don't tell anybody, but they were just puppets, you know. Good night. Good night, Jeffrey. <laughs> keep everyone awake with your jokes. He was very British, and the street which he lived in was a typical row of houses that you find uh, in Britain. 
and that, that street was the street in which I lived at the time. It was in Putney, still in Putney. I changed the name very slightly because it was called Festing Road. I changed it to Festive Road. Festive Road was quiet. Inside number 52, Mr. Ben was sitting down, thinking. Perhaps I may even visit the costume shop and have another adventure. The facade was of a very normal bloke who would go down to an ordinary clothes shop and he'd see the shopkeeper and he'd go into the change room and suddenly he'd be transported into another world. And it was that sense of going from the mundane to the exciting which kind of really grabs children's imagination. Mr Ben walked through the door wondering if he would come into a circus ring. It came out of the 60s. The whole period was pretty escapist one way or another. I think people were really finding themselves again. As if by magic, the shopkeeper appeared. Not once did Mr. Ben actually purchase anything from that shop. And why the shopkeeper kept letting this loser in, I had no idea. Mr. Ben took the outfit into the fitting room. He looked like this sort of civil servant, but the sort of civil servant that you knew is going to be caught up sooner or later in some sort of sex scandal. I mean, if anyone was coming out of the closet, it was Mr. Ben. I think he did it every week. He looked at himself in the mirror. Then he looked for the other door, the door that always led to adventures. I started making them in 1970. There were 13, 15 minute films. And most people are surprised that there were only uh, 13. Colorful birds flew past. One of the questions that I get asked about quite a bit is, was he tripping? Was he on drugs? Is it really about that? A flying carpet. <laughs> Ah, oh, child of the 60s it was, Mr. Ben. And probably if he wasn't uh, tripping, he was the only one who wasn't. From the opening piece of music, it was... Boom, you're in. You're off, you're rocking. Now, here's the cartoon. You're flying through, and then, of course, there's like a fight in the canteen, and the sausage goes in, and it just all kicks off, and that was almost the best bit of Grain Chill. I was really trying to find a killer idea as a writer, you know, to make my name. You just ruined my map, you pig. And don't you flippin' well call me a monkey either. Why not? You stack the trees, in you? And it just dawned on me one day when I was going into uh, employment exchange. Straight. And why not write about schools? Because everybody has to go to school. Um, everybody has to attend. And it doesn't matter what the socio-economic class is, whatever the geographical position is. There hadn't been a contemporary school story. Any school stories that there had been had been about um, boarding schools and things like that. And there was nothing that was relevant to then. Can you remember that lady who came and gave us that sex education talk? She said, when you get older and you have babies, it gets better. Flipping it! Who wants to have babies just to get rid of period pains? The girls were genuinely moody and wore makeup to school and got sent home and didn't care. There were some genuine rebels on there. You know, most of them bunked off school and were glue sniffing and stuff like that. It was brilliant. Don't! It's part of people's lifestyle. People over, people over 30 always shout Tucker. You know, people under it obviously shout Mark. But anyone who's old enough to remember it always shout Tucker and it always, always cheers my heart. <laughs> Where'd you get it from, Tucker? Sweet shop there in our road. He was a sort of larger than life character who could get away with lots of things. He could be cheeky, all the things that I couldn't get away with in real life. And I thought, yeah, I fancy some of that. <laughs> it was seen as groundbreaking because it was exactly what I chased for, which was uh, real kids with real working class accents dealing with kind of real issues and real incidents in their schools. Samo! Parents didn't think that schools were like that and, and politicians didn't think that the BBC should be doing things of that nature. What's up with her? She's got the arm. I have not. Yes, you have. She don't know whether she should let Andy... You bitch! But the kids liked it all right. Young love. Everyone goes on about how gritty and realistic it was, but actually it's so not gritty and realistic. You haven't come to, uh, you know, take it away, have you? They rescue donkeys and keep them in sheds on the school grounds. Now, I went to a South London comprehensive, and if 
people at high school had discovered a donkey on the school playing fields, they would not have gone off and got a shed. They probably would have slaughtered it in some kind of ridiculous ritual, smeared themselves in blood, like Lord of the Flies. Flip an egg, Benny. Once upon a time, not so long ago, there was a little girl and her name was Emily. 30 years ago, I was the real Emily, age seven. And she had a shop. It was rather an unusual shop because it didn't sell anything. My job really was to look after Bagpus and supply him with broken toys and ornaments and things for him and his mates to mend. But then Emily said some magic words. Bagpus, dear Bagpus, so fat furry catpus. Wake up, be bright. Be golden and light. Bagpuss, oh, hear what I sing. So this is the saggy old cloth cat, Bagpuss. I made most of Bagpuss. Um, only my needlework wasn't quite up to making the paws, so my wife Joan made the paws, which are rather nice, aren't they? A bit squeaky. And this is Emily's shop. This is where Oliver Postgate and I made all the films. When Bagpuss wakes up, all his friends wake up too. The mice on the mouse organ woke up and stretched. <coughs> Madeleine, the rag doll. Madeleine is the sort of mother of the family. She tells the mice stories and she keeps them in order. Last of all, Professor Yaffle, who is a very distinguished old woodpecker. Everyone seems to remember Professor Yaffle. He's a dry old stick. He's not very... A lovable, you'd think, but everyone seems to like him. Whatever is the use of one shoe? You couldn't wear it. You'd have to hop everywhere. You can't do anything with it. Oh, yes, you can. Oh, yes, you can. You can, you can do something with it. it. Old shoes are good shoes. In one of the episodes, um, uh, the mice um, decided not to sing. What are you all standing there for? Mice like to sing. Mice not sing. Mice not work. Mice strike. My theory about Bagpuss is something of a socio-political allegory of modern society. Bagpuss represents the individual. When he wakes up, uh, society becomes active around him. The mice, they represent the proletariat. They're frozen on the organ of the state normally. And Professor Yaffle, he represents the intellectual. I mentioned this theory to Oliver Postgate and Peter Fermin once. They seemed very surprised, in fact, because they thought the whole thing was about a stuffed cat. Bagpuss gave a big yawn and settled down to sleep. London, home of the Cockney, the Winkle Stall, the Thames Gas Board, and in a quiet Mayfair pillar box, the world's greatest detective, Danger Mouse, and his faithful assistant, Penfo. It was witty, it was fast, it was really well made, um, and it was funny. Danger Mouse! Amazing! Danger Mouse! Astounding! Danger Mouse! It was a parody, really, on a, um, a Patrick McGowan spy show called Danger Man. I'm beginning to think that Greenback isn't playing fair. The cast was terrific. Uh, David Jason played Danger Mouse. Terry Scott played Penfold. Ooh, crumbs! What is it, Penfold? It's the walls! David Jason and Terry Scott were very good for one another. The competition between them jacked the pair of them up to really quite spectacularly energetic performances. It's no use, Penfold. If only you had that spanner I gave you for Christmas. Do you mean this one, Chief? Uh, Penfold was you, equal wait, to Danger Mouse. Give it to me. I had it in my stocking. There was a sense of rivalry which came across actually as excellent comedy, but yes, uh, uh, he wouldn't let Danger Mouse get away. <laughs> oh, Chief, you're a genius! Only how are you going to get us out? I am going, Penfold, to use my head. Oh, Chief, didn't, didn't that hurt? No, didn't feel a thing.
If you've got a success, it happens in the playground. It doesn't happen with promotion, it doesn't happen with anything else. It's either there or it isn't. And Danger Mouse was that. He's about as much chance of winning as I have of flying down a Yeti's ear hole. We just got it right, you know. You count your lucky stars, don't you? <laughs> It was, it was fantastic. It was so well done. It was beautifully made. Very fun. It's time to play the music. It's time to light the light. It's time to meet the Muppets on the Muppet Show tonight. People talking about who was on this week, who was going to be on next week. And it was sort of the pop stars of its day. It's time to put on makeup. It's time to dress up right. Took the Muppets absolutely seriously when you did it. It's time to get me started. And though out of the corner of your eye you could see the manipulator, you never looked at the manipulator, you looked absolutely in the eyes of Kevin the Frog, or whatever his name was. It's time to get things started on the most sensational, inspirational, celebrational, motivational. This is what we call a Muppet Show! I mean, I liked it when they had the guests on. It was a bit like, I suppose, the way that Morecambe and Wise worked at Christmas, where they had top guests coming on, making complete asses of themselves. Hello. Now to have Rudolf Nureyev, you know, come on a show with Miss Piggy was something oh none of us God. could ever have imagined would happen. Uh, well, uh, if you're warm, maybe you're overdressed. No, I'm fine. Maybe I'm overdressed. Interestingly, with The Muppet Show, you have Henson developing for the first time a kind of elaborated female character in Miss Piggy. But I'm a woman first. Who one could read as kind of a misogynist character, uh, making fun of femininity, or you could read as kind of an appealing, aggressively, uh, aggressively mocking the norms of femininity. Kermit, of all the lousy cheap shots you ever pulled on me. Oh, I, I know, Miss Piggy. I'm, I'm sorry. I didn't realize that's it, that 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 whole sketch was going to get that far out of hand. Oh, please forgive me. <laughs> There is a, a, a thought among actors that it's dangerous to play with children or animals. Uh, I, I, I would add puppets to that because they always steal the limelight. So, you are a practicing psychiatrist, mm. Doctor? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. How long you been practicing? Uh, 35 years. Ah, oh, isn't it time you stopped practicing and got on with it? <laughs> I think that what was important to the success of the show was to find the adult audience. Like Sesame Street, The Muppet Show played on multiple levels where adults could get a kick out of it and kids could get a kick out of it at the same time. I like that last number. What did you like about it? It was the last number. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>by a long, long way. Yo, hey, what's happening, dude? I'm a guy with a rep for being rude. Matt Greeny clearly had written it from the point of view of a kid, but it was about the time that Matt had just started having kids, and so then he started understanding what it was also like to be a parent. Everybody, if you can do the fun, man, shake your body, turn it out. The 
The astonishing achievement of Matt Groening was to do enough for the children and enough for the adults. I think like all truly great kids programmes, it's not just for kids. Yeah, it is for kids, um, but it's made for adults. Hey, what gives? Boy, I tried ordering you, I tried punishing you, and God help me, I even tried reasoning with you, and the only thing left for me to do is jump the gorge myself. Uh, uh. What? Why? Because that way you'll see what it's like to witness a family member stupidly risking his life for no good reason. He's sort of poking a very large finger at the American way of life. They're laughing at the, the fact that the majority of people in America cannot actually keep up with the, the family values that are thrown at them by the television. You know, boy, I don't think I've ever felt as close to you as I do right now. <laughs> I'm gonna make it! I'm gonna make it! This is the greatest thrill of my life! I'm king of the world! Woohoo! Woohoo! I. Ah! The show is willing to admit that the family unit and the institutions that we live by, the police and government and hospitals and all the institutions, are run by human beings. No! In the Simpsons world, they're they're seen as corrupt or stupid or uh, or inept. Like all great, great comedies like uh, that are done by animation, the soundtrack is is the root to it all. You know, fantastic voices. Give me Wonder Woman, wow, and that golden lariat. She can tie me up any time. Oh, hips are all chocolate. Wait, I like chocolate. Mm, chocolate. <laughs> it really does celebrate the underachiever. Somebody who has clearly, uh, really lacking in, in brains and ability. All I got was 50 cents. Hey, when I was your age, 50 cents was a lot of money. Really? Nah. The one-liners are as good as anything you get in Frasier. Ugh, I am through with working. Working is for chumps. Son, I'm proud of you. I was twice your age before I figured that out. The slapstick is as good as anything Laurel and Hardy ever did. Homer was yellow, Mom was too. Because I put mothballs in the beef stew. I'm a bark man. <laughs> God bless America for the Simpsons. Hey. Absolutely wonderful. Oh. It's not just the best children's television program ever, it's the best television program ever. Eat your heart out, Michael! Oh, wow, well, man. Get the cool. Get the cool to shine. Uh, could somebody call me a cab? Do you know who I am? I'm Harky Hair. There must be a cab for Harky Hair. I say. Oh, they've all gone. And to have your say in a major movie show coming up later this year, take part now in the 100 Greatest Films. Vote at channel4.com forward slash greatest.